seat. We call Roy Bedard. This way, sir. Yes. Here, face the clerk. Raise your right hand. Be sworn. Mr. Director, I'm going to introduce Mr. Lee, so I'll be back. Thank you. I'm going to Loud and clear into the microphone so everyone ha can hear what you have to say. Yes. Council, feel free to move about. Thank you. All right, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury, spell your last name? Yes, my name is Roy Bedard. Spelling my last name is B-E-D-A-R-D. What do you do for work, sir? I am a police trainer. Can you tell the jury um, about your educational background, sir? Sure. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in criminology and criminal justice from Florida State University, a master's degree and a PhD in educational psychology also from Florida State. When you uh, were taking your master's and PhD uh, educational programs, did you do any special, uh, I guess, educational experience in movement, action, that sort of thing? Yes. So my major is in sport psychology. Um, it's sport exercise and performance. I focus mostly on the performance side because for most of my life, I've worked with law enforcement officers, military soldiers. So I didn't spend a lot of time discussing volleyball and baseball like my cohort did, but rather law enforcement officers and the way that they behave mostly under pressure. Can you tell us about your experience, um, you know, if you were a law enforcement officer and for how long and for where? Sure. I started in law enforcement. I went to the academy in 1986. I had my first job with Florida State University Police Department in 1987. I stayed there until 1990 and then transitioned to the Tallahassee Police Department without missing a day and uh, stayed full time with the Tallahassee Police Department until 1996. At that time, I left full time service and went to the reserve status. And in Tallahassee, the reserve program is a paid position. It's a, it's a fully authorized law enforcement officer. So I continued to do that until um, about 2015 when I retired. I left because I started my own police training company and started to train internationally. But let's talk about your um, experience. Can you do me a favor? You see the microphone there? Yes. Can you pick it up and put your book underneath? Yes, sir. I think that's the microphone that's making noise. <laughs> Thank you. You may proceed. Yes, sir. Um, if you can, sir, can you tell us about your uh, experience with teaching? Uh, We'll talk about nationally first and then nationally. So I, I've taught um, around the world, as I said. I've trained in over five continents. I made a uh, living doing that. That's what I did most of the time. For about 25 years, I was traveling um, around the United States and outside the United States. I think my most extreme year was about 300 days one year outside of the U.S. training internationally. What would you do when you train internationally? So I focus on use of force and defensive tactics. This goes to an earlier background that I had even as a child participating in the martial arts. So I've always been involved in teaching law enforcement officers tactics. So my niche area was to teach law enforcement officers, corrections officers, military soldiers, how to um, tactically deal with situations in the environment that was unique to them. Were you also a professor at the Pat Thomas Law Enforcement Academy? I still am. Can you tell us what the Pat Thomas uh, Academy is and what they did? So I think the Pat Thomas, we have, first of all, there's many academies in the state of Florida that train law enforcement officers locally and regionally. I think the Pat Thomas Law Enforcement Academy, which is under the guidance of the Tallahassee Community College, is the closest thing we have to a state law enforcement academy. It's where all the state agencies essentially headquarter. And so I've started there in 1987 as a defensive tactics instructor, and I've continued on without pause to this day. At the Pat Thomas uh, Training Academy, did you also teach multiple classes in police tactics and police procedure? I did. So those are all certification courses, what we call the high liabilities. Um, I do teach firearms. I do teach defensive tactics. Of course, I teach 
general topics. And most recently, perhaps due to the amount of time I spend in court these days as an expert, they have me teaching the legal block to law enforcement officers. From the Pat Thomas uh, Academy, do you also, are you, I guess, a an adjunct professor at the other uh, colleges in Florida? I am. So a few years ago, after being in Tallahassee for about 37 years, I moved to Sanford, Florida. And um, Tallahassee, I, I still teach at, as I said, I still have a residence there, but I am also now teaching at Seminole State College as an adju adjunct professor. We have somebody from IT to come look. I don't, I don't know. It's not him, I don't think. Yes, it is. It is? Oh, is that what it is? All right. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Make sure you speak up. Okay. Let's uh, transition back, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go forward again. But when you were a law enforcement officer, can you describe uh, some of your duties you had when you were with the Tallahassee Police Department and with Florida State Police Department? Yeah, I was a patrol officer, which meant that I, I worked the streets. Um, I was answering calls for service. I was taking reports. I was dealing with suspicious incidents, domestic violence, the kind of things you would expect an on-call law enforcement officer to be dealing with. I did all of that. But in addition to that, I was a field training officer. That's always been my passion and my interest. And um, I don't know if, if I should describe what the field training officer is. But a field training officer is a sort of a transitional trainer. When you leave the academy, of course, you come to a police department. And for example, at, at Pat Thomas, there were many different agencies that would be represented inside the academy. So you might have people there from the Tallahassee Police Department, some from the Leon County Sheriff's Office. You might have some from the Quincy Police Department. And when they break out of the academy and go in service with their respective agencies, there is a transition that has to be done so that they can function in accord with that particular uh, community. So policies are different from place to place. So field training officers are employed to help them transition, to take them from their earliest basic recruit learning to being fully functional on the street. And that's about a four month process or three and a half month process that involves different phases in which they are um, not only placed in a patrol car, but they're, they're observed. They're, they're, they have what are called daily observation reports that are written for the purpose of establishing their um, competencies in some cases their incompetencies. Sometimes we wash them out. They don't make it through that phase. But if they are successful, then they are graduated to full law enforcement officer. During the course of your, your career, you know, just in the law enforcement portion, how many times do you think you've been at that TO mentoring other officers or teaching you? I don't know. Um, I did it for 10 years as I was a full-time law enforcement officer. I would say maybe 100. When you were, uh, as a professor uh, and teaching at the Pat Thomas Academy and also in Seminole County at the college there, uh, how many police officers do you think you've instructed over your career? Um, thousands. I, I mean, that's what I've done for the last almost 40 years. Have you been called on by FDLE to participate uh, in, I guess, designing the curriculum for law enforcement? I have. FDLE is the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. That's officially our our state agency. And we have what is known as a, uh, a post. We don't call it that. We call it the CJSTC, the Criminal Justice Standards and Training Commission, which is our equivalent of any other state's police officer standards and training, thereby the, the acronym POST. So CJSTC, which is governed by FDLE, is responsible for writing curriculum. And the curriculum is um, administered to every academy in the state. So I was sourced as a subject matter expert by the CGSTC for now probably 25 years, and I've been responsible for several iterations of curriculum. And those iterations have and continue to be used by um, well over 50,000 police officers and corrections officers in the state of Florida. And just backtracking to when you were a law enforcement officer, besides being a field training officer, uh, have you responded, uh, how many calls do you think you responded to as a police officer when you're on the road? Oh, it's hard to say. I mean, every day is different, of course, but I mean, if you take 10 years and, I don't know, look at the number of calls four days a week, again, it would have to be thousands. 
Have you investigated uh, road cases before? Yes. Have you investigated stolen vehicle cases before? Yeah. Have you just uh, patrolled areas, you know, high crime areas, doing uh, private policing? Yes. In reference to marijuana, um, are officers trained on the smell of uh, marijuana when they go to the cabin? They are. Uh, is there two different signs of it, like the smell when it's burning and the smell when it's raw? Yeah, it's a very pungent substance. I mean, when you smell it even in its raw form, you usually can identify it as marijuana. Um, it has a more pronounced and probably a farther reaching scent when you burn it, of course. Um, but, but still, you would be able to tell it was marijuana. It doesn't change the scent that much. Were you, uh, when you were with Tallahassee the Police Department, were you a trainer at the Police Department? Yes. What were you a trainer in? Um, I, I was a trainer in use of force and defensive tactics, mostly in, as I said, a field training officer. So I spent a lot of time doing what we'll call general patrol procedures for uh, newbies out of the academy. Okay. And then I, can you tell us the name of your company that um, you transitioned to in 97 or 98? 96. Uh, it was, yeah, the, the, my corporation started as Rapid Rotation Baton Incorporated. It was the name of my flagship brand. It was a police baton with a holster. Later, I expanded to developing and patenting other law enforcement equipment and doing consulting work. And so I uh, created a DBA called RRB Systems International, which is um, the corporation that I put out front now when I do the kind of work that I do. Part of being part of the uh, RRB system, are you called upon to do uh, testify on the board? I am. Have you been hired uh, by the best attorneys and United States attorneys in the past? Yes. Are you also hired in civil cases? Yes. When you're hired by the criminal context, what, what do you think the percentage of defense attorneys are who hire you to the percentage of uh, state attorneys? I would think it's probably in the neighborhood of around 80, 20. Most defense attorneys hire me. I get hired a lot for stand your ground cases where subjects may be, for example, accused of aggravated battery or murder and trying to um, bifurcate the, the rules of law versus the incident itself. I offer testimony in the area of stress performance. Have you uh, testified in court before in uh, rest, uh, reference to the use of force? Yes. Have you testified in reference in court for, for defensive tactics? Yes. Have you testified in court as an expert in standing your ground? I have. Have you testified in court to police tactics before? Yes. Uh, in police procedure? Yes. And perception and reaction times? Yes. How many times do you think you've testified in court, sir? I think latest count it's over 50. I don't know if it's 53, 54 or something like that. And, and, in respect to that, that doesn't include all the depositions you've conducted? No, I, I don't know. I've probably done two or three times as many depositions. Does this um, have, uh, ask to be allowed to have the witness offer an opinion? If yes, the witness will be entitled to uh, express an opinion. Yes, sir. Um, were you asked to in uh, May of 2023 in this case? I was. What were you provided to review in order for your consultation, sir? I don't have a list of everything, but I was given what I'm typically given, which is sort of what I'll call the case file on a particular incident that would involve police reports, depositions, photographs, videos, um, sort of satellite data. In this case, I think I had some emails that were sent to me. Um, I had lots of video, some body <laughs> camera video from a variety of different officers. I had a, um, an edited video, a slow down version of incident itself. Um, I think that covers it. Based on uh, reviewing uh, those items, were you able to make observations and uh, be able to offer some opinion about police procedure and police tactics in reference to this case? I was. Uh, before we get into that, if you can, um, have you ever heard of the word in your experience, the word case? I have. Can you tell us if that's a reference to the officer? I mean, it can be, for sure. If it's directed at a police officer, it is typically a derogatory term. I've, frankly, been called that before. So um, it's definitely not an endearing term. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can I get you to get closer to the, to the microphone over here? Yeah. Yes, sir. If you can, sir, um, 
Can you tell us uh, what proactive policing is? Yes, proactive policing is sort of an evolution of the earliest policing. We like to call it peeling method. We, uh, we sort of uh, adopted the policing system here in America from our earlier ancestors, the English, and Robert Peel is often cited as being the, um, the father of policing. Peel's idea of policing was that police officers should sort of not be seen, not be heard, until there was a problem. And that's known as reactive policing. In other words, a crime occurs, then the police show up and they help you out. We discovered over the years that crime control was better than response to crime trying to prevent crime. So the idea of proactive policing evolved. For example, uh, firefighters are reactive. They stay essentially in the fire station until a fire happens and they respond to it. Law enforcement officers used to do that as well. But of course, what was happening, crime was going undetected, unlike fires. So what we had to do is put officers into the field to get into the wrinkles of society to examine whether everything was baseline, in other words, stable. And as a consequence, there have been many programs that have been very well funded by the federal government and by various state entities to encourage more proactive policing. Things, for example, like community-oriented policing, um, various types of bicycle units that you might see out there where officers are not limited to the roadways so that they can get into the recesses. Um, foot patrols, something that you may see, for example, in the bigger cities, like in New England cities, um, started to appear in the South, where officers would be concentrated into what are known as problem areas. And these problem-oriented policing, for which there are grants for that as well, became proactive to try to uh, not only discover crime, but to, to forge or perhaps reforge after the 1960s a relationship with the community so that the first time you saw a police officer wasn't when there was a tragedy. It was you got to know them personally and we, we formed a partnership with the community so that uh, we could get valuable information that could help us fight crime through um, this, this collaboration of um, community members, law enforcement officers, uh, people that had special interests in the community and that type of thing. If you could, uh, could you give some examples or describe how uh, proactive policing is utilized in the times today? Sure. Um, I, I gave you a couple examples. I mean, getting out on, on, on foot is one thing. As, as vehicles advanced throughout the ages, of course, it was much easier for law enforcement officers to roll up their windows, turn on their air conditioner, and be in a bubble as they patrolled. And what it effectively did is it, it separated law enforcement officers from their community. Um, Proactive policing is certainly as a matter of policy and as a matter of um, academic study, encourages officers and their agencies to open their windows, to park their cars, to get out of their cars, to talk to people. Um, and that's one form of it. Like I said, the bicycle units, you perhaps have seen police officers wearing shorts, that would have been considered very unprofessional 30, 40 years ago. But the advent of bicycle officers was to, once again, I think, law enforcement, to put them into clothing that didn't look so authoritative, you know, with the polyester and the baubles that hang off of it, but to make them look more relaxed and to put them onto, well, onto vehicles that didn't have windows and didn't have air conditioning so that they could penetrate different areas of the community. And as I mentioned previously, these bicycle officers are oftentimes capable of getting into places where crime happens. Criminals tend to not commit crime in the open, um, where law enforcement vehicles would be Notice perhaps blocks away. They come in with lights, they come in with engines that you can hear. So they became very stealthy. But I think there was a sense of, um, of security that the community feels when they see officers out who they can talk to, they can ask questions to. Sometimes they just like to make small talk, you know, and, and say, how's everything going, that kind of thing, without being so concerned that perhaps something has happened in the community just because they're now used to seeing officers that are in their environment. Are officers trained at the academy in the use of proactive policing and that theory of policing? Yes, they are. Have you trained officers yourself in proactive policing? I have, especially as a field training officer. As a law enforcement officer during that training, are they trained um, in baselines 
for uh, product of police? Maybe if you can explain what that might mean. Yeah, so communities function differently, right? So I think it's fair to say if you've traveled the state of Florida, you probably know that things are a little different in Miami than they would be, for example, in Tallahassee. So each community has a baseline, and officers who work areas come to know that baseline. And sometimes they can either, either be further segregated into this part of the community sort of behaves a certain way versus that part of the community behaves a certain way. So when you're on patrol and you're trying to consider what to get involved in or to um, investigate further, you're looking for these sort of aberrations in the baseline. So I'll give you an example. If you went into a church on Sunday and it was very quiet, that would be pretty normal. But if you went into a club on a Friday night and it was silent, that would be kind of abnormal. If you walked into a church on a Sunday and everyone was screaming, you would think that's outside of the baseline. But if you went into the club on a Friday and everyone was screaming, you might think that that's just part of the environment. So law enforcement officers are trained to recognize baselines and to respond to changes in baselines, to be sensitive to aberrations, to look for things that are unusual. Sometimes they're easily explained, other times they might be criminal, but nonetheless to be curious. So law enforcement officers, I think the first, um, when they get hired probably from the selection process, the first quality that we're really interested in is, are they curious? Because that's what communities anticipate they will have in their law enforcement staff. Now, in reference to on a daily basis with proactive policing, when an officer comes on shift, can you describe what procedures they're taught normally that would lead to proactive policing? Sure. I mean, bearing in mind that law enforcement officers are humans, they, they take their boots off and they take their uniform off and they hopefully go back to a fun and meaningful life. And so what happens is during those periods, they miss a lot. They end up going home and hopefully not thinking about anything until shift starts again. So there's some catching up to do. When a law enforcement officer arrives for work, they usually begin with some form of check on. Now that has evolved in agencies throughout the state and the United States because we're able to do digital check ons. We're able to check on from laptops, for example. It used to be we'd all assemble in the squad room. Some agencies still do that. And there would be information that was imparted to those officers with respect to things that have happened, <clears throat> mostly during the time that they were absent. Sometimes it might be information that perhaps they were looking for something yesterday and that person still hasn't been found, so we'll be reminded of that. So the check-on procedure is really a catching up period. It's an opportunity for officers to become more vigilant in the field, to know what they're looking for, not just to look for these aberrations, these unusual and suspicious circumstances, but to look for specific things, you know, for example, missing persons would be something that a law enforcement officer would have front and center, right, on their console of their car. They'd have a description of that individual. And of course, they would be very concerned about their safety. So they would prioritize looking for that person. Stolen cars, stolen bicycles, anything that might make the check on list would be something that a law enforcement officer would take notice of and be mindful of throughout their shift. So officers are trained when they come on ship to review the previous information or the present information so that, that they can utilize that in their proactive. Yeah, it makes them more effective. Objection, Didi. Oh, sustain. Was looking for stolen vehicles uh, something proactive policing that officers would be trained to do? Yes, certainly. Absolutely. In reference to that, would basically any sort of crimes that occur, if they, be, if they were notified, is that part of proactive policing to be looking into those? Yes. I mean, anything that's happened in the community, like I said, that they weren't privy to because they weren't working when it happened, um, it's just sort of due diligence to give the oncoming shift officers the information that the last shift had as they take their boots and uniforms off and go back to their lives. Do, do law enforcement officers, uh, as part of proactive policing training, are they taught to just sort of mingle with the community or to interact with people? Sure. Why is that, sir? 
Like I said, I think it humanizes law enforcement. I think, you know, years ago when law enforcement showed up, everyone would clamor to the windows and wonder what's going on. I think today, because they've become integral to the community and they are um, out of their cars talking to people, intermingling as, as partners in this, in this crime prevention, uh, the communities have grown accustomed to them and tend to be less reactive to tragedies that happen along for Sometimes tragedies do happen. And I think less judgmental and more understanding because they actually know the officers that are involved in these different episodes. So I think it's important uh, as, a, as an investment in the community to create policies and to encourage programs that keep officers interacting with the community all the time, not just when crime occurs, but you know throughout the day and throughout the night. When an officer, you know, is proactive and interacts with a community member, um, can that sometimes uh, transition into them doing an investigation when they see unlawful activity? Sure. So, I mean, not every interaction is um, without suspicion. There are some times when officers will, will get a hunch, for example, that something is wrong. Maybe nothing is terribly overt, but, you know, we develop sort of these interesting senses that I think can't be explained in science, but law enforcement officers notice things about people. They notice, you know, furtive movements. They notice perhaps expressions. They might notice um, how one person seems to drift away from the group or other people don't assemble around. Little things that I think people who aren't trained and don't work this kind of job don't typically notice. But law enforcement officers notice it. And so they, they speak with people to clear things up sometimes, if they have a hunch, if they think something may perhaps be wrong, they'll engage them in conversation. They'll watch not only um, what they say, but how they behave, how they act. They try to develop an understanding of what's really going on. And so um, I, I think that these, these interactions with the community can be very innocent, if you will, meaning that they're nothing more than to develop rapport. And other times they are investigative to attempt to figure out if there may be a crime afoot. Why is it important for law enforcement officers to look for uh, behaviors and actions? Because this is about crime control. It's about criminals not being overt. You know, they don't walk around with a sign saying criminals. So you have to identify these individuals from amongst a much larger population. And you do that through behavioral cues. You do this through conversation. Um, you do it through observation. Most of the sense that we use when we deal with people is going to be a visual sense, things that we see. And so we, we tend to attend to things that are speaking to the law enforcement officer as, once again, a violation of the baseline. And even if it's a small violation, it doesn't have to be a gross violation, but even a small violation, that will, that will capture an officer's attention and draw them to you. In reference to uh, behavior officers are looking for, can you tell the jury, um, you know, when an officer is, is talking to an individual, um, is that person's response or lack of response something an officer should be looking for? Why? It is. I mean, most of communication is interpretation, right? It's not what you say, but necessarily how you say it. or. There may be some indication of nervousness. There may be some indication of perception in the way that somebody says something, even though the answer that they've given you is a perfectly fine answer. So law enforcement officers are trying to interpret real meaning of things. And so subsequently, I think a large part of the communication is not the question itself. It is actually the behavior of the individual, the cues, if you will, that trigger an officer to think something isn't right here. So, so hypothetically, if an officer engages an individual and they're not responding to the questions or, you know, being evasive, is that something law enforcement officers are trained to take into account when they're in that uh, interaction? It is. It, uh, it, would, uh, it would inform an officer that perhaps something isn't what it appears to be. Can you tell us what the duties of a law enforcement officer are? Well, they're vast and they've expanded. I mean, the original duty of a law enforcement officer is in the title. It was to enforce laws. But I probably don't need to remind anybody in this room that we just went through a couple of years of 
uh, re-examining the role of law enforcement officers and even to the point where we have talked about bringing other people to the police function, like for example, social workers. Those are skills that law enforcement officers are expected to have. You know, sometimes they're enforcing laws, other times they're counseling, sometimes they're um, providing uh, emergency services, sometimes they're providing first responder medical services. They wear a lot of different hats. So the duties of a law enforcement are very vast, but I think generally public safety is primary when it comes to a general uh, overarching theme of, of policing. It's public safety. And um, officers are inclined to do a lot of things that may not even be spelled out in policy um, in an attempt to keep the community safe. Can you give us some specifics like on, on a normal shift, what an officer duties would be? Uh, focus mainly on the law enforcement portion. So I think I covered a lot of that. I mean, law enforcement is trying to identify people who are breaking the law. And of course, law enforcement officers are not lawyers. They're not um, legal technicians. They are working off of their understanding of uh, the statute as it came to them in the academy and in service training and through their FTO programs and things like that. And so their identification of somebody that appears to be doing something that is inconsistent with what the statute requires would draw their attention and cause greater interest. Would being on patrol in a police car or driving in, in a neighborhood be part of Duty of oh, absolutely. Would getting out of your vehicle and making contact with citizens be part of the duty of the police officer? Oh, for sure. Would, would investigating or following punches of, of something that they think could be criminal or could be related to criminal activity, is that part of being a police officer? Very much so. Is a drug enforcement or identification of a drug enforcement part of the duties of a law enforcement officer? It is. I mean, it's a specialized area as well. There are narcotics officers that go to classes and form teams and sometimes task forces for the control of narcotics in a community. But every law enforcement officer is trained in, in being able to identify narcotics. That's usually where most cases start at the street level by the patrol officer. And then often that information is turned over to, for example, the narcotics unit for further follow-up. So patrol officers are key observers of um, the drug culture and what constitutes um, uh, use, sale, distribution, things like that as they go about their patrol procedures. May I approach the witness, Judge? You may. Are those, sir? These are still shots from the video that was sent to me on the encounter between Officer Rayner and the Are they fair and accurate depiction of what is on uh, the video? Just still shot? <clears throat> yes. Anything seem to be changed or all? No. Just to sign a state move in state wide line. Any objection? No. Without objection, admitted as evidence. <clears throat> Judge, I may have the witness step down. You may. Be sure to keep your voice up okay. when you're down there, okay? And Judge, I'm going to um, publish State's 12, uh, which is Officer Rayner's video with yes. witness. It's already in evidence. Yes. As close you can to the video there. Okay. Where you can still see it. <laughs> I just want to play this all the way through and then um, ask you some questions. 
How's it going? Do you live here? What's going on? Do you live here? Why, what's going on? Sit down. Sit, 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 what? sit. Sit, sit, sit. Sir. Can you sit down? I'll talk to you. Okay. Down. Come sit. on now. Sit. Come on now. Sit. Don't do this. Sit down. Why are you asking me do sit I live here? Do you live here? Yes or no? What's going on though? Cool. Charlie 777. No, back up. Stop. 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 Stop, man. <laughs> And if we just pause it there. So first off, I want to start out with, um, have you had an opportunity to review this video um, multiple times? Yeah, I have. Based on your observations, is there any uh, anything missing from this video? No. Can you explain why you're, based on your opinion, your expert opinion, why you believe this is the initial starting point of the interaction? When I first saw this, it appeared to me that when the officer first approached that the Wallace is somewhat startled. That, that this is a, a, a sudden interaction, not as if something happened previous to this that would have been ongoing when the camera came on. So it looks like the beginning of the encounter. Now I'm going to uh, show you what was came in as, is it 52 now? 52. The witness is entitled to render an opinion as to what he's watching. The ultimate conclusions as to what the video shows, it's up to you. You do not abandon that role as a fact finder in this case. Thank you, sir. I'm going to hand you this uh, pointer. Um, if you can, um, when an officer has an interaction with, with somebody, w where is their focus uh, initially, or where do you guys train officers to focus? We train them to focus on hands. You have a couple of reasons, obviously. Um, as we talked about earlier, narcotics is a actually very well established criminal enterprise. There are, there are certain techniques and tricks, if you will, that people who sell drugs and silos are permanent objectives and non responsive department. Oh. You know that law enforcement officers may be watching because that's part of that proactive patrolling. Totally. Part of that proactive patrolling. Um, they tend to watch the hands. That's where hand transactions are made. Um, but probably more important than that, which is something that is, um, for lack of a better word, pounded into officers from the time that they're in the academy, through their in-service training, well into the FTO program, is it's the hands that kill you. So law enforcement officers, not knowing who somebody is, perceive everyone with vigilance for their own safety. And so they direct their attention to the hands. <laughs> in, in this case, um, is Officer Rayner's flashlight illuminating the hands it is. That is exactly what I would expect an officer to be looking at. And I think from a social perspective, most of us look at the face. When we approach people, we, we try to gather data from the face. Law enforcement officers, again, look at the hands, and this is where we can see the lights being focused. Now, in observation of states 51A, uh, Initially, when you, when you look at this, do you see an item in the hand? Not what the item is, but do you see any items in the hand, sir? Yeah, I don't know what it is, but I definitely see an item there that is more of this thing. And if we go to 51B, uh, a little bit better shot of it, can you see that item in the hand still? Yes. Um, and then if we look at uh, 51C, if I can point right there, is that still in the hand? It is. In 51D, are you able to see it still on the hand there? Yes. And if we can uh, start with um, 51B, based on your observation, um, where is, is Mr. Wallace's phone initially? Uh, initially, I think when I see him, it's on his lap. Um, and then it goes into his right hand. And, and, and here in 51, B, uh, I'm sorry, 51A, is it in his left hand at this point? When you're right? No, right. Uh, no. So, sorry. And if we can look at um, 51D, does uh, it, it appear that the phone is transitioning uh, to uh, the left hand? It is. Conscious of the left hand to sort of see the phone. And then. Are we able to see, uh, this is 51E, uh, 
Are you able to see his right hand devoid of the phone at that point? Yes. Is is the phone and um, it, when you watched the video or able to observe it, is the phone and that white object in the same hand at that time? They are. Yes. <clears throat> Now, let's, let's talk about if we can go back to what is states 12. When Officer uh, Rayner, uh, can you just talk about the procedure, about how his approach is? Um, and and if, if he was investigating a, or if any officer was investigating a stolen vehicle, how would they go about identifying that specific vehicle? Uh, really two ways. You'd have to look at the identifying features. You can get them off the rear license plate, or you can get them off the bin plate, which is usually positioned at least in the front of the vehicle, if not alongside the door. Looking at the way that this vehicle is backed in, would it be um, safe or tactically appropriate for an officer to go to the back of that vehicle to look at the license plate? Immediately. Yes, sir. Why not? And explain what the proper procedure would be. Well, any officer that saw somebody sitting in a car that perhaps was a stolen vehicle would recognize that the real threat is not the vehicle. The threat is the stolen auto. The threat is the driver. So officers would learn, they would be trained, to control and stabilize the driver first before conducting any further investigation. Not to question this is still a fact finding investigation. You want to get a read of who the driver is. Is this likely a stolen vehicle? Are they acting nervous? Does it seem that I should be more concerned with this than just a encounter where that could be easily dismissed with a proper explanation? Why would it be dangerous for, it, it, hypothetically, for an officer to go behind a vehicle at night with someone in the driver's seat and, and like bend under the car? Why is that dangerous for an officer? You can infer from my last statement that I said that officers watch the hands. So whenever you attend to something that isn't going to protect you, for example, a license plate, you are not capable of attending to something that can actually hurt you, like for example, a person's hands, their relative position, access to weaponry, all the kind of different things that can happen to you. The way uh, you, you've seen it, let me play it and then we'll talk through it. How's it going? Do you live here? The, the way that Officer Rayner is, is approaching um, Mr. Wallace, is that, is that consistent with the way officers are trained in, in these kind of situations? It is. And, and why? So I think with invigilation, where you have a community that wants some monitor, it's this sort of balancing act between infringing on someone's right to be left alone and officers trying to figure out what's going on. So they've learned kind ways of doing it. It usually starts with a greeting, sometimes an introduction. My name is Officer So-and-so. What's going on? What's happening? Just sort of open questions. Um, it's not authoritative. It's not intended to be frightening, even though for some people it may be. And I think they see a law enforcement officer, perhaps they think the worst. Um, but it is a, it's sort of a, a, a greeting. It's a greeting by an individual who society accepts is a vigilant protector of the community. Now, if we watch um, Officer Rayner's, oh, do you live here? What's going on? Where Officer Rayner uh, positions himself, can you explain tactically why he would position himself there and and what the benefit is and why he'd be doing that? Yeah. So I can't get his head. I don't know what he's saying, but I would say, if if this were a, if I were writing a textbook on this case, I would talk about three major concerns that an officer would be interested. One of them would be uh, their safety. First and foremost. The second thing would be escape. If this is an individual that's committed a crime, right behind him, you can see on the photo, there's a fence there, and it's a crushed fence. It has 
barbed wire that's been pushed down by multiple trespasses. It's easy to get over. It's easy to get back. So escape's important. And then thirdly, it's going to be the investigation itself. That's probably the least important thing. But to make sure that you can contain or stabilize the individual, you would position yourself in the best way possible to be able to quickly put hands on in the event that you were in a sudden fight, or to be able to put hands on if they were to escape. If you could determine that they were stabilized, they didn't seem to be a threat, you could take your chances, and you could perhaps start your investigation. Would an officer's approach maybe be different at night as during the daytime, depending on the lighting? I think so. I think, as I said to you previously, that most of the information we gather is through our eyes, and we're all disadvantaged at night. Of course, that's why we give officers flashlights, because it allows us to see better, even though it is still a beam, typically. So we're still unable to see many things around them. That creates a little bit of anxiety for law enforcement officers and their employees in their environment that they're not seeing that in the day, perhaps they would. Now, now we noticed that Officer Rayner initially, when he gets out of his vehicle, he doesn't uh, call dispatch and say, I'm out of my vehicle. Can you describe if that's consistent with law enforcement procedure and, and why? It is. As I said to you previously, law enforcement officers are engaged in a lot of this contacts. Most of them go nowhere, I might add. Um, you don't want to be the officer that cries wolf every time you get out of your car. You notify, know, hey, I need backup, I need help, here's what I'm doing. So a great part of law enforcement is this communicative feature of talking to people and trying to determine if something is wrong. And if there is something wrong, then you advance into all police procedures, which is the idea that you would call for backup, the idea that perhaps you would change your position, maybe go back to your car and run some things, things like that. But the initial step is really just trying to find out who this person is, what they're doing there, and whether or not they are... Uh, a threat to the community. Now, now a, an encounter like this with a citizen, can it tr uh, transform into a situation where an officer then feels like they have to radio for dispatch? Sure. Is that common for it to take a little bit of time for an officer to, to, to gather that information? Yeah, it's, it's not as common as, as I said, the majority of people we talk to, nothing happens. But when it happens, it happens fast. And so law enforcement officers have to be vigilant to that fact too. And I think we see later on in the video, um, do, do you observe Officer Rayner queuing up his radio? I do. Would that be consistent with the training of law enforcement officers? Yes. Let me just play this for a moment. Sir. Now, now we see Officer Rayner putting his right hand out to, to Mr. Wallace's shoulder. Um, I guess it's his left shoulder. Can, can you explain what Officer Rayner what, what that is and, and why he'd be doing that? Sure. So we teach something called reactionary gap in use of force and defensive tactics. And the reactionary gap is, at, in part, based on your environment. There's only so much space that you might have. For example, over here, there's a car. There's, you can't really back up. But we try to keep a reactionary gap because of what's known as a reactionary time principle. Things happen before they even register on your mind in about 0.25 seconds. The idea, for example, if you're driving down the street and the car in front of you hits their brakes, it'll be about 0.25 seconds before that registers and you hit your brakes to stop. That's an important thing to know. That's why you keep car lengths between the car in front of you and yourself, so that it gives you reactionary time. So this is similar to that. When you have an individual who can strike you, for example, and we're not talking about a shooting or even a stabbing, but just a knockout where the hand can reach you. Officers are trained to put a hand out to, to create that reactionary gap where they can't step back, and in this case, he's not able to step back. So it seems to me, again, not knowing what's going on in his head and not pretending to know that, that this is consistent with the tactic, tactic of establishing distance so that the eyes can perceive what's going on in the close quarters. Of course, you lose most of your visual acute. So just to clarify, um, Officer Rayner is just once Mr. Wallace is approaching him, he's trying to create distance so that he can react? I think he's trying to maximize distance. There's two ways of doing that. One is for you to step back, and two is to push the other person back. So it looks to me he's almost doing both of those things when he puts his hand on him. Um, oftentimes, we teach officers to put a hand up and say, get back, without actually touching. But if you're in that close quarters, there's a, there's a very good chance you're going to make contact. You may have to create distance by pushing them.
And we, we talked before, I just want to listen, if we can listen specifically to the words that are spoken, and I'll ask you some questions about those, sir. What's going on? Do you live there? Why you live? What's going on? Let me just back it up a little more, sorry. How's it going? Do you live here? What's going on? Do you live here? Why you live? What's going on? Sit down, sit, 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 sit. Sit, sit, sit. Sir. Can you sit down? I'll talk to you. Okay. No, come sit. on now. Sit. Come on now. Don't do this. Sit down. Why are you asking me to go this here? Do you live here? Yes or no? What's going on, though? Is Mr. Wallace um, being compliant and answering the questions of, of Officer Rayner? Objection. I can ask it a different way, Judge. Based on your observations as an expert, what, what are law enforcement officers trained in when people don't answer the questions? What does it cause them concern and what is the problem there? So you can see that this evolves from questions to commands. It starts with, what are you doing? Do you live here to sit down? So there's an evolution here in control of the officer or by control of the officer. Officers are generally trained that if somebody's not compliant, certainly with commands, that it's oftentimes a distraction. Um, the distraction frankly, is quite psychological. It has to do with the fact that we're not able to focus on two things at one time. So if somebody asks you a question, you're not able to think about other things because you're thinking about the answer to the question. And I think we all understand this intuitively. We don't have to be taught this. I was taught this in my programs. But we kind of know that if you continue talking when someone's trying to do something, they're quite distracted from it. Perhaps people can relate to the fact that they're trying to do homework and work from the office and somebody's making noise in the living room that they have to go somewhere else or tell them to shut up. And so this distractive feature is commonly used by um, folks in the community who are trying to prevent officers from making uh, contemplated decisions about what to do. Stop. 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 Stop, man. Now, is Mr. Wallace um, being compliant with the officer's commands? Are officers trained in a situation like this to um, ask someone to get back in the vehicle? Yes. Why, why, why would an officer in this situation want the person that they're talking to to sit back in the vehicle? Those are the first two points you made. The primary point is not to get hurt. The second, it's, it's not to lose them because they fled. When you're in a vehicle, you're contained and you're somewhat stabilized. Now, there may be weapons in the vehicle, but at least you can see them. At least you're aware of it. So you have the reactionary timing to your favor because you're placing them in an area where you're going to be watching their hands. But what you've eliminated is mobility, the ability to quickly run, to fight, to do the kind of things that the officers are also afraid of. So when you can contain them inside of a vehicle for a question, it gives the officer a little bit of a relief and anxiety so that they can move on to the next part of the investigation, which is the investigation itself. <laughs> Based on your, your, your expert opinion, um, based on what you watched in this interaction, did Officer Rayner use any unlawful use of force? Objection based approximately the jury. Did Officer Rayner um, follow proper police procedure from what you observed in the interaction? Objection with the predicate and based approximately. Thank you, Jeff. You can ask right up there. Hypothetically, if an officer uh, 
stops the vehicle and uh, makes contact with that individual before you know, you know, being able to investigate or, or follow up on what they're doing. Would it be appropriate for the law enforcement officer to to ask that person to sit down in the vehicle? Yes. And and if that individual failed to comply, would it be appropriate for the law enforcement officer to to use a level of compliance appropriate for that situation? Yes. I have just a moment, Judge? Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Um, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. Or it might be more effective that way. I'm sorry? Could you please stand? Okay. Mr. Bedard, you discussed a little bit about the, uh, the information that you viewed um, in connection with you being uh, paid by the state to be here today. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, how much have you been paid by the state to be here today? Well, today I've been paid nothing so far. Okay. Um, but I've been paid forty five hundred dollars for days. And is that a running bill? Could it be more after today, depending on how long it takes? Um, that's going to be inclusive. Understood. And you talked a little bit about uh, receiving uh, numerous materials to review in connection with your testimony. Do you, re do you recall that testimony? I do. And among the materials that you review, you would have to agree that there was no nine one one call that a member of the community placed alleging Otha Wallace was engaged in any criminal activity. That's true. You would also agree with me that you received no information, any report that a member of the community flagged down Officer Rayner and accused Mr. Wallace of committing a crime. That's correct. Uh, there's no information to suggest that Mr. Rayner was dispatched to 133 Kingston as a result of any complaint. That's true. We're watching, um, I think this is the beginning of the video, right? Yes. Uh, if we had 30 seconds more video, we would be able to see exactly Officer Rayner's vantage point when he comes around the apartment, correct? I assume so. I don't know what the EWC was shown in the dark, but I mean, he got in his way. You, you mentioned the dark. This is June 23rd, right? Yes. Are you familiar with you're, fam you're familiar with the summer solstice? It's the longest day of the year, right? It's not completely dark out in this parking lot. Do you agree with that? No, it's not okay dark, but it's certainly dark. <laughs> you mentioned before um, officers are trained uh, to detect, I think, non-compliance with the statute or something that's incompliant with the statute. Do you recall that testimony? When it comes to elements of a crime, law enforcement officers are looking for things that are that are consistent with those elements. And, inconsistent with the baseline community standard. Okay. And you would agree that in looking at this video here, there is nothing apparent that is inconsistent with any statute? Well, that's not the only reason that officers talk to people. Okay. Sir, did you understand my question? I did. Okay, the question was, based upon an observation of this frame at this moment in time, do you observe anything that's inconsistent with the statute? I observe something that should be inconsistent with the statute. So the answer is no, you do not see anything inconsistent with the statute. I don't think at this point we can see anything except somebody sitting in a car in the dark. Okay. Let, and it is perfectly legal for a person to sit in their car in the dark. Do you agree with that? Not if it's not their car and they're breaking in. Okay. Please describe to the jury what information one could glean from this observation that suggests that Otha Wallace is not in possession of a vehicle that he has a right to possess. There isn't, and that's why the officer got out and asked questions. Okay. And what, what do you see in this video which makes Otha Wallace deserving of some suspicion that he potentially doesn't possess? Objection, Judge. Speculation of what's deserving? 
I'll sustain the objection. You want to ask a hypothetical? Okay. Please point out specific observations in this particular frame, which would suggest to a reasonable officer that Otha Wallace is unlawfully in possession of that vehicle. You're framing this as a reactive response. I'm framing it as a proactive one. So there is nothing that the officer knows at this point, except that Thank you. he is controlling a high crime area. Thank and there's somebody in, the, in his car. Okay. And is it? My apologies, Your Honor. Is it your testimony to this jury that a person's mere presence in a high crime area allows them to be subjected to immediate inquiries about their activities? Police officers don't talk to anyone about anything at any time. Okay. And if the question that's posed by the officer is not based upon some particularized suspicion and they're performing a lawful duty, the person can end that encounter at any time they want. Isn't that true? It depends. It happens very rapidly where an officer may go from mere hunch to thinking that a crime is occurring. And the person on the receiving end of that wouldn't know that. So they're not entitled to just walk away. No. Okay. So if an officer does not have probable cause or reasonable suspicion to detain a citizen. Well, don't object us to these standards. They weren't brought up in the right. They're not relevant. Your Honor, they've come in, in, in the case. He's a use of force expert on police tactics about what he trains officers in terms of discerning and not discerning. Well, we've got to get constructive viewers in the law. I understand, Your Honor. Um, is it your testimony that any person at any time, for any reason that an officer believes is justified, has to subject himself to being detained by a law enforcement officer? Uh, yes. If a law enforcement officer believes that a crime has been committed, the other person may not be aware of it. And as part of a social contract, though it may be an inconvenience for someone, they have to stay there with the officer until they are properly dismissed. Their recourse is in court, not on the street. So your, your testimony is that upon an officer's just belief that a person is committing a crime, that an a individual, a citizen, has to subject themselves to detention and inquiries? Yes. Your Honor, may, may we approach? Um, Yes, Your Honor. Um, respectfully to what Mr. Bedard just testified to, I think he mis misstated the law. I think that I should either be entitled to some latitude or a curative instruction. What Mr. Bedard said was that only upon an officer's belief that they're doing something, a person is doing something wrong, that a person has to be subjected to a detention. That is not what the law allows, Your Honor. What the law says is that if a officer is not possessed with a reasonable, articulable suspicion or probable cause, then a citizen can terminate the encounter at any time. That's a consensual encounter. And what Mr. Bedard has just said is inconsistent with that. I'm not saying he was being nefarious or uh, anything other than giving his well-founded belief on that, but that's not what the law says. This is germane to the case. He's been called in to testify under some cloud of, of expertise that he is uh, all-knowing in terms of this encounter. And we believe that the jury should be able to have a full vetting of the appropriateness of this encounter. And what a better way for us to be able to either instruct them on the law, which is POPL 9151, about the encounters between police and citizens, that you can walk away. If there's no probable cause or reasonable suspicion, you can walk away. That is the law. If there's probable cause, you can't. And if you do so, that Officer Rayner was involved in a lawful execution of his duty. And in furtherance of our self-defense claim, we are allowed to undermine the good faith and lawfulness of his actions. And if he's overextending the parameters of a police citizen encounter, we should be entitled to fully confront that and subject uh, uh, the witness to cross-examination. And furthermore, we believe that the jury should be instructed on the parameters of the law. Okay, uh, Mr. Provisco, I asked a question, a totally loaded question. For the answer, and the, the witness answer to the best of his knowledge could be, the defense thinks it's an issue of reasonable suspicion and probable cause in this case. The state doesn't agree with that, Judge. I believe the jury instructions are sufficient. And if it was Mr. Risco's question that solicited it, he shouldn't have asked a question that he didn't know the answer for. And we asked the court to deny that. We didn't bring any of that out in our direct, purposely and carefully to make sure that we did cross the barrier to judge that. We did.
All I'm asking for is. I did not give that. I don't know. I'm trying to keep this objective, and that's objective. I don't want him to testify to what was in the defendant's mind, or what was in Officer Rainer's mind. You can look at this video all day long and have his opinion about you know, what was going on in that video. But at the end of the day, the jury will have to decide, you know, they can subject to look at what's going on in those people's mind. At this point in time, he's not entitled to get into the shoes of either, either party here and then say, no, he shouldn't have quite. He can say, hypothetically speaking, this is a textbook, but this is what I'm not to do, or what I'm about to do, or, you know, how we see reactions of individual defendants, what is consistent with what I expect, or inconsistent with what I what expect, and what reaction that will garner, generally speaking, not necessarily in this scenario, but, you know, you see what you want, they can think what they want, the jurors can think what they want. So I'm going to go ahead and overrule the objection, um, not give a jury instruction. I don't think that yours, I already said it once to them. Well, tell them again that this officer is this uh, witness here, is not instructing them on the law. I get to do that. So that will be my ruling at this time. May I ask for some clarification? Um, yeah, of course. Here, here's what, I, what, I'm, what I'm struggling with, is that I may ask the court a question in terms of I believe that Roy Bedard's answer to the question was inconsistent with the law on consensual encounters. I already told the viewers, not here to instruct them with the law. I understand that, Your Honor, but I feel as though we are being hamstrung in, in presenting this information which we believe is relevant to the jury, that a citizen does have the opportunity to walk away from an encounter. And that's all that I'm asking of Roy Bedard. Roy Bedard has said, there's no situation, only an officer's belief subjects a person to detention. And that's that's not what the law is, Judge. So you're asking him to opine on the law? No, I'm not asking him to opine on the law. I'm asking him to, to use his expertise in when he trains an officer. It would be inappropriate to train an officer that just upon a whim and belief, you can go up to a person and detain them and subject them to inquisition. That's not what the law says. The law says you have to have a founded suspicion. And now he's testified to the jury that upon just my mere belief and hunch that I can detain you. Why, why, why can we not present a, a cross-examination on the fact that you have you have the ability to walk away. Okay, my ruling has made this clear. You walk across the one he trains people to do and not to do. You know, at the end of the day, we're gonna argue the law during the charge conference, and if you can argue those things with the jury based upon the instructions that I give. Well my ruling. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bedard, you testified before you're a pretty busy guy right? traveling around the world testifying. Yes. Okay. And in connection with your, your job, have you ever had uh, a moment to sit in your car and take a phone call? Yes. And you do a lot of training with police officers, is that correct? Yes. Right. Uh, let me give you, in, and when you're training them, you, Part of the training is you're giving them hypothetical scenarios, correct? Yes. And you're instructing them on how to deal with these potential scenarios that they'll, that they'll come across in the real world, correct? Yes. So in the hypothetical training model, you're essentially defining the facts upon which the officer is being trained. Do you agree with that? I mean, you're, you're, you're setting a hypothetical. You're saying, here are the facts. Yep. How would you react to yes. that? Okay. okay. Would you agree with me, or let me ask you this, would you train your officers that if they saw a person sitting in their car talking on the phone that it would be appropriate to then go up and detain that person detain them. Um, it would be appropriate to go up and have a conversation with them right yes and when we talk about detention we're talking about um acting in such a way or doing something that makes a person feel as though they're not free to leave yes um and similarly, what you would also instruct your students in that scenario would be if the only facts that you possess are a person sitting in their car, that person's free to walk away at any point in time. <laughs> if the officer commands them that they can't leave, then it's a student officer doing something that the person sitting in the car does not. For example, maybe they are a suspect. So, when they, so, so the person is not entitled to walk away. The officer says it's stop or forces them to sit down. They are only entitled that is not a state sign the person is entitled to it. Okay. However, what you just testified to rests upon the qualification of if the officer has a well-founded suspicion. You agree with that? 
So I did once again, I got to be careful because I'm not here to instruct the theory of law. I can say we're training law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. Reasonableness is always part of the So making a reasonable difference or reasonable belief, these kind of things which I don't think you included in the last question, those are determined in the highly side of the day. An officer just needs to believe that it's a thing that's reasonable. I mean, he may be found later to be unreasonable as it be objectively to his standard. But the subject of reasonable standard, an officer does something. It's assumed that that belief to him at that moment is reasonable. And it can't be contested at the street level. And you're instructing your students, obviously, to act reasonably towards members of the public, right? Well, we instruct them in the, in the criteria of what should be considered reasonable if they continue to follow the instructions of a training, they conform to the training. But again, that's why we have courts, because we're not always correct about it. Sometimes an officer's actions are deemed unreasonable in court, but that doesn't invalidate necessarily the street laws. Sure, and I, and I appreciate that. I'm, I'm asking you from a, from a training module perspective. You would agree with me that you would not instruct your students to make a command upon someone unless they had a reasonable suspicion that that person was engaged in a crime, about to be engaged in a crime, Judge or objection. possessing some criminal contraband. <coughs> Judge objection as to legal standard. You would agree with me that you would not train your students to command someone to do something, whether it be sit down, stand up, or otherwise, unless they had a reasonable belief that that person was doing something wrong. So we have to buy the kid that for this. For example, the time of obstruction. It means you're not letting me do my job. And that happens suddenly. For example, if I'm investigating and you decide to stand up, push past me, run away, that's a separate crime. So that happens instantaneously. So the officer, the person might be interviewing something. They might say something like, What's going on here? What's happening? Do you live here? Those kind of things. Mm -hmm. That's just inquisitive. But the person, not the one with the officer, has not put you on, decides to suddenly leave. And the officer says, Stop, sit down. And the person refuses, we now have another crime. So there's probably cause for that crime. Correct. But in order to get to that point, in order to make the command, you have to have a reasonable suspicion that somebody is doing something. So I'm going to object as to legal standard again. You know, we, he's, he's now talked about the crime of obstruction that has elements to it that is germane to the court. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Sure. The, 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 the issue is this, and respectfully, I think that you're overcomplicating. If an officer makes a so command. Is just argumentative and disrespectful to the witness? Oh, I'm going to finish the question. Sir, if you're making a command on a citizen, you can't just do that for any reason that you desire, right? That's correct. Okay. So the reason that you would command a citizen is because you are, let's agree on this baseline, about to do some investigation, right? Yes. And if you're going to do some investigation, then you would possess some knowledge that the subject of your investigation is potentially engaged in some wrongdoing. That's maybe it, yes. Okay. And, and, I, and I think that we can agree that the, the, the standard of potentially engaged is a good faith basis to believe that. Can we agree with that? Yes. All right. Um, and when we're talking about a good faith basis to believe something, let's advance the video for just a little bit here. Okay. I think before in your testimony, we'd agreed that at least in this portion of the video, from what you using your uh, expertise, we don't see anything criminal going on right here in this still shot, correct? No, not, not. Well, and I'm just going to advance it for a few seconds. How's it going? Do you live here? Now I've advanced it just a, just a second or so. Okay. Same situation. Same question to you. You would agree that there is no, I'm just talking about just what you see in your interpretation of the video. There's no discernible criminal activity going on in this, in this picture right here. There could be, but I, I can't see it. Okay. And, and you are seeing, just as everybody is seeing, a very good representation of Jason Rayner's vantage point when he's walking up to this vehicle. Well, I'm only seeing. I'm not smelling. I'm not hearing. I'm hearing things that Jason Rayner would have to visit. I think we have a two-dimensional 
uh, impoverished media that drives body cam. Sure, and, I, and I, I appreciate that response. There's audio on this video as well, is there not? Yes. Okay. You would agree with me that in the contents of the video that we played thus far, there's nothing that is audibly apparent that is criminal in nature? I would agree with that. And just while we're on this car here, you would agree that Mr. Rayner doesn't shine his flashlight or go over to the side of the, the passenger side of the vehicle, right? He does not. Okay. In, in, in training your law enforcement students, I'm sure that you encourage them to hone their powers of observation, correct? Yes. Because just as it's important to use those to, I guess, apply your proactivity to those deserving of suspicion, you don't want to capture people that are undeserving of suspicion. Would you agree with that? You'd have to operationalize the capture. You mean okay. see somebody or to... I think, that, I think that was poorly worded, but you, to the extent that's reasonable, you do not want to apply suspicion to someone who is undeserving of suspicion. I think that's correct. Right. So, in doing so, an officer is relying on things like bolos, correct? Yes. Okay. Can get you I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, and in a, in a bolo, it can come over the dispatch, right? Yes. It can come through the email. Yes. It can come from a, another officer just telling you something. Yes. If an officer has a bolo, that contains a picture of a vehicle, you would agree that you would instruct your students to pay careful attention to the way that that vehicle appears? No. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think more broadly speaking, there are so many different types of vehicles and I wouldn't expect them to be expert in all of the nuances between, for example, models um, or of a make, or particular make. So, I, I mean, there would be a degree of reasonableness and time. I mean, there's actually a way of training people to be expert in birds and cars and things like that, but it involves mind-numbing hours of observing a certain vehicle, perhaps hundreds of times, to be able to catch up on those nuances. So law enforcement officers are trained to look, for example, in this case, silver Honda. And may I just get back to, to a, a much more simpler issue, which is that... Can you just ask that the witness be allowed to answer a question? Sorry, I apologize. Were you, were you finished sure. with your answer? So that would be the starting point, Silver Honda, right? So then we have to figure out, perhaps with the make, that would be the next thing. We have time to do it. In this situation, I, I think it would be very difficult for an officer to see the makes it's probably not bad. Then, but I, I, okay. I don't, I don't mean to interject, but I think that the, going a little bit beyond the, the scope of the question, the question was just a general one in terms of powers of observation so it, yeah well, that's where I was heading okay so the powers of observation are going to go from broad to narrow sure so the first thing is silver Honda then we're going to look for make then we're going to look Again, I don't I don't mean to be rude I'm not asking anything specific I was just asking about a, a training model in general can we can we agree that you're training an officer to use their best reason their best observations to distinguish between a vehicle identified in a bolo and a vehicle that they see on the street yes okay and with respect to the evidence in this particular case, you would agree with me that among the items that you reviewed were states to the five, correct? Yes. And when, <clears throat> when you, a reasonable officer, in looking at this vehicle, would be able to see. You people with that in the race, so they know what this here. This is states to the five, the bolo that we spent all day Monday talking about, okay? And would you agree with me that there is a feature on the, uh, the roof of the vehicle? Yes. Okay. Would you agree with me that upon a rear look at this vehicle, uh, one can observe the taillights of the vehicle? Yes. Okay. And those taillights extend all the way from uh, probably the midsection of the hatch all the way up to the top? Yes. Uh, similarly, there are observable on both sides of the vehicle door handles, correct? Yes. Okay. You would agree with me that the a vantage point as exists here would allow a person in the same position to see portions of the back lights? I don't know. I don't know what uh, the officer can see. Again, because of the darkness and the angle that he's coming in. I, and what he's looking at, remember, he's attending to the driver. He hasn't quite gotten to the vehicle yet. And, and you would you would agree with me that uh, what you're seeing in the video is inconsistent with the way that an officer would approach 
a high-risk vehicle. If the officer knew this was a stolen vehicle, then they would have probably stayed back and conducted a, what we call a high-risk stop or felony stop. So we, we can agree that the actions that we see in this vehicle are inconsistent with Rayner acting upon suspicion that this is a high-risk vehicle. No, I wouldn't agree with that. I think he has, there's an entry point to figuring that out, and that is the mercy. And that's what we're seeing. Okay. Would you agree that it appears to you that he's not sure if this is a stolen vehicle or not, because that's not how we train officers to deal with stolen vehicles and high-risk stops? Objection, Judge. Speculation as to what Officer Rayner's thinking. Okay. Have you had an opportunity to view this video extensively? Yes. And in connection with your view of this, this extensive view of the video, um, you have rendered certain opinions about the police tactics that are observed in the video. That's correct. All right. And you have provided prior testimony concerning your observations of the tactics employed in this video. Yes. And you've, on previous occasion, given testimony specifically on the procedure utilized to uh, approach this vehicle yes okay and in connection with that you would agree you said it appears that he is not sure if this vehicle is stolen vehicle or not that's not how we train officers to deal with stolen vehicles high-risk stops that's right okay so what we're seeing in the video is inconsistent with how you would train an officer to deal with a high-risk vehicle correct no okay do you remember having your deposition taken? I do. And that was on August 24th, 2023. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. okay. And for the record, I'm looking at page 27, line 24, over to page 28, line 3. Would you agree with me that I'm handing you the deposition of Gordon Bedard taken on August 24, 2023? Yes. Yeah. Can you please read from lines 24 on page 27 to page 28, uh, line 4, and see yourself, and please let me know when you're done. Previously, before I handed you the deposition transcript, you disagreed with this question, which was, it appears to me that he's not sure if this is a stolen vehicle or not. That's not how we train officers to deal with stolen vehicles, high-risk stops. Do you agree that the words that I just recited were the exact words that you stated under oath on August 24, 2023? Yes. Okay. Thank you. In the video, you don't you don't see a flashlight directed to the passenger side of the vehicle, correct? No. Advancing the video a few more seconds. Do you live here? What's going on? Okay. You would agree that when Officer Rayner approaches the open driver's side door of Otha Wallace, that he does not introduce himself. He doesn't say, "Hi, my name is Officer Rayner." That's correct. You'd agree that as we advance the vi the video further. Mr. Wallace asks several questions of Mr. Rayner as to why he's being inquired upon. Yes. Okay. And you would further agree that at no point in time does Officer Rayner indulge Mr. O. Wallace in the questions that he is asking. So I'm going to object. Is the court ruling that I can't ask him what's going on in the video? I ruled that the video is not valid. Okay. Do you, he, do you ever hear Jason Rayner respond to Opal Wallace's questions in the video? Jackson Judge. You know what I mean? Well, we've been asking about what's been observed in the video. I'm, I guess I'm just confused as to the difference between that and what he's trying to like. Okay. Uh, do you, do you ever hear 
In the video, Jason ran respond to both of Wallace's questions. Objection, Judge. Uh, Mr. Bernard, you would agree with me that in the best evidence of the video, Mr. Rayner does not reply to both of Wallace's questions. He does reply, but he replies with a question, which is inappropriate. And you would agree in this particular, this is not the best frame, maybe advance it for a second, but How's it going? You would agree that the, the video also depicts Mr. Rayner making no stops from the exit of his vehicle directly to the side of Otho Wallace's vehicle. Makes no stops. You mean he has his paws at the outside of the door before he goes to the inside? No, it looks like it looks like he is positioning himself for the unexpected. And just in a, in a few moments, we've seen the video of a lot of times, this is probably a, a good depiction of it, but in just a few moments, you would agree the video shows Mr. Wallace go and approach the small gap between the door and this break bar. Correct? Judge, I'm going to object. That's an improper statement. It's not a few moments, it's a few seconds. The video is the best thing. You didn't have to break on the video for this witness. Okay. Um, in instructing your students in, in police training, if you were going to discuss a manner in which an officer could detain an individual, would you agree that one of those circumstances would be to position the officer's body in between the only means that the citizen can uh, freely move? If you're detaining them, yes, that would be one way of doing it. Okay. And you would agree that what we see in the video is a red car here. Yes. Okay. Uh, a door that's open here. Yes. And a very short window between the opening of the door and the red car. Yes. And then you see Mr. Rayner position himself in that only small opening there, correct? Yes. And you've been in several parking lots in connection with your law enforcement duties. Yes. Okay. Uh, you would you would agree with me that what's depicted here is consistent with a, a very small space between an open door and this car here, the red car. Yes. Unable for a human being to get through without either the person moving or the door being closed. That's correct. Additionally, in this video, we have a large amount of shrubbery from the back. Yes. It would not be reasonable to assume that a person in the same situation could leave through the back. Not sure that's true. Okay. There's a lot of evidence of people going over that fence. Sure. Um, certainly you'd get cut up and it would be difficult. I don't think you'd get cut up a lot. I mean, it seems to be a popular way to get into this complex. Okay. Have you ever been around the woods? Okay. Have you ever been around Palmettos in Florida? You ever walked through the woods? Yeah. You can get pretty cut up with those, can't you? Can, sure. All right. Um, so when Mr. Rayner walks up to this point, of the open car door, he has blocked Mr. Wallace's ability to freely leave from his vehicle. I, I would think that that's true. Okay. Yes. And now we've we've kind of gone, I think we're four seconds into the video right now. In the previous three seconds, you've agreed with me that there were no observable uh, items of criminal activity in the video. Correct? I, in the video, no, but I don't know what's going on in Rainer's head. Again, so. But I, I can't see anything None of us can. Okay. And similarly, criminality. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean I didn't mean to talk over you. But as we are here now, four seconds in the video, right before Mr. Rayner approaching the side, you'd agree that there is still no criminal activity depicted in the video. I'm not sure. Um, you talking about before he gets to the door? No, sir. I'm asking you. Let's just start with okay. four seconds into the video. You'd have to probably put me there. I'm afraid I. Okay. Know. We're at four. four we're at, sure thing. We're at four seconds of the video. Okay. You agree that I'm pointing at four seconds? I do. Okay. And you would also agree with me that if you're using your you know, four years of expertise, you can't see any observable violation of the statute in this frame. I can see what he's doing. See, I can't see what he is. So he may, for example, have seen something in his hand that he follows our thoughts. I don't know. And we're not, he's not here to ask, obviously, so I can't tell you what his thoughts were. I would like to ask him that. But 
to your question on, a, on an impoverished two dimensional video, I can't see the sun coming out there separately. And you mentioned before that you can't see Ozil Wallace's hands in this video, correct? I can't see that. Okay. And the vantage point of this video is from a camera that's mounted on Jason Rainer's chest. Yes. Okay. So if we're, if you can't see his hands in the video, right? No. Okay, so if you can't see the hands in the video, it would be unreasonable if you're using this as a training module to then say to your students, based upon what you can see in this video, you can make an assumption about what is in someone's hands. Well, the video is not what Rainer's operating from. He's operating from his eyes, which are all the way higher. He's a different advantage of that. You see in that vehicle? I don't know. You should be able to touch that, but I don't know that answer. I have to only get what I get from the chest one by one camera. <laughs> we'll advance it for just a second. Oh, do you live here? Oh, yes. What's going on? Oh, sit down. Sit, 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 sit. And we've advanced now to, to, to nine seconds. I think we can agree and probably move on from this point that you don't know what Mr. Rayner did or did not see in this particular frame of the video. I assume he's looking at his camera special where the light is doing. He's attending to his hands, whether or not he has that to register specifically that he has a phone, he has what appears to be, you know, some type of object in his hand. I can't say that. Okay. And do you do you have a good recollection of uh, the state's questioning of you just a few moments ago? Yes. Okay. And my recollection, correct me if I'm wrong, I just would like to show you what's been it's a composite exhibit. 31 from the state, there were some photographs taken. You looked at some photographs that were taken of the interior of my client's vehicle? Yeah. Okay. Um, you reviewed those in consideration of your testimony here, did you not? Yes. Okay. And as a law enforcement officer, an expert at trials all around, well, you're probably familiar with what switcher tool is, correct? Yes. Okay. In connection with your direct testimony to the jury, were you provided that picture of a switcher to my client's video? Just can I object on the sidebar? Yeah. Okay. And my question is simply this. During your direct examination, not previously, during your direct examination, when you asked about the photo. Is that an evidence? It is an evidence. I believe it's part of Exhibit 31. The positive Exhibit 31. Were you asked about this photograph in your direct examination? No. We see... You would agree that Mr. Rayner's hand is upon Mr. Wallace's shoulder, or at least approaching him in this particular frame. He's touching him, but he's certainly. I don't know if he's touching him, but it is in front. Yes, I'm sorry. Can you sit down on. Uh, do you have a good recollection of the video, how it transpired from here to its conclusion? Pretty good, yeah. Do you agree that there is not a time as we move forward in the video where Mr. Rayner ever releases his grasp from Mr. Wallace's body? Again, it's in the spirit of uh, being precise, I don't know if he releases it from Rayner. On the video, it appears that the discussion is going on. That's the problem with two dimensional videos, it's like lap death. So I can't try to do this way. Do you live here, yes or no? What's going on, though? Cool, Charlie, seven, seven, seven. No, back up. Stop. Stop. In this particular video, in this particular still shot of the video at 2050, uh, you would agree with me that you see Jason Renner's arm? Yes. You see his hand? Yes. You see his hand grasped around Mr. Wallace's shirt? I'm not sure if I can see that. Okay. Do you see a shirt? Sure. I don't object as to. Do you, do you agree that Mr. Rayner has not let his grasp go of Mr. Wallace's shirt? Objection does. Would is there a uh, a method of training that you can point to which involves grabbing a citizen by the back of their clothing 
such that it restricts their breathing into their neck. I don't think that was the point of that grab. Okay. It's showing the patients as a officer kind of from the chokes and the grab trying to control. Sure, I, I, I appreciate that response, sir. My question to you very specifically was, can you think of in your line of expertise in training your police students, is there a procedure that involves grabbing a citizen by the back of their clothes, restricting their ability to breathe? You're making that kind of a procedure. The, the, the difficulty in breathing would be uh, incidental to the oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to put it. In many of our procedures, if not all of our procedures, where we are doing control holds involved in grabbing oftentimes clothing. And we talked a little bit before about um, commands to a citizen. Um, and let's talk about the other side of that in terms of compliance. So you would, tr you would teach your officers that um, if they are you know, acting upon some reasonable you know, belief, um, that a person has to obey the commands. They have to comply, right? I mean, there are some, there are some considerations. For example, if an officer is unreasonably using deadly force, officer doesn't have to, a person does not have to comply and be killed. But short of that, yes, uh, individuals are required by statute, mm -hmm. to, and officers are taught that, to comply with their commands, right or wrong. And as I said, the rightness and wrongness is usually determined in a tribunal setting. Yes, officer. Sure. And a, a component to uh, your training of, of police officers is kind of how to manage the human factor of, of stress in, in the moment, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, how to, and, and stress has a, a physical manifestation. Do you agree with that? I do. Uh, heightened breathing. Yes. Inability to concentrate. Yes. In, inability to articulate oneself. Sometimes decision making can be uh, impaired in many regards. Yes, I mean, if I can just break for a second, you're, you're saying stress in its extreme. Because there are many levels of stress where none of this is impaired. So depending on how acute the arousal is, those things can happen. It doesn't happen to everyone at the same time. Those are certainly artifacts of stress. So it's just the way we the drive the age of the Thank you. And I, I think what, what we can both agree upon is the reason why you need to train law enforcement officers to manage those emotions is because Without the training, human beings are going to be susceptible to have those emotions overcome them in a stressful situation. It's possible. Some of it's personality oriented. But yes, we, we assume that we're training officers to a standard, and that standard applies to all of them. Yeah. So if a citizen doesn't have such training, um, you know, they're potentially not equipped with the tools to deal with the stressful environment. Um, and before you, you had mentioned that we, I think as society, we universally accept that uh, police officers are vigilant protectors of the community. Did, did I accurately characterize your testimony before? I don't know, but I'd agree with that statement. Uh, okay. Uh, so it's your testimony before the jury that every single person in the community except the law enforcement officers are vigilant protectors of the community? Judge, I'm not object. That's the speculation. That's not what you said. Would you train your officers when they're going into, let's say, for instance, a high crime area, that the officers should have an expectation that the citizens that they may encounter will view them as vigilant protectors of society? Well, I think that they, the community at large, and I don't like to speak in extremes. I mean, I, I'm a scientist, so there are always outliers, and there's always these like so you wouldn't be something. But I think collectively, the community does agree that proactive policing is important for, for the uh, sanctity of the places that they live. Yeah, and uh, proactive policing is, is often applied to the most impoverished areas of our community. Would you agree with that? Right. Um, I don't want him to be examined just standing up in the background. Governor, I think you can sit down. Thank you for pointing that out. No, you're not. I might use it on re redirect, Judge. So. I don't know how long it's going to reach for. I'm sorry? I don't know how long it's going to I'm happy to move it back now if you'd like to. You want to move it back now? Move it back when it's time to be clear. 
Crime happens in affluent communities? Yes. Crime is committed by all peoples of all races, of all creeds, of all beliefs? Yes. Uh, and you talked a lot about your uh, instruction of your police students that pro the proactive policing model is the appropriate one, correct? Appropriate to what? It's, it's, an, it's a very important part of policing. Yes, I agree with that. Right. Um, yet we are applying this proactivity in a way which we both agree is only targeting a certain portion of the population. I don't agree with that. Okay. Well, before a few moments ago, I think we agreed that uh, rich people commit crimes. Yes. Black people commit crimes. Yes. White people commit crimes. Yes. Do you know people commit people. the relevance of this? Sustain. There's a limit to proactivity, though, correct? Yes. Just because an officer wants to be proactive doesn't give them the ability to go and make a command upon someone. No, the ability to be proactive is sort of a general theme. The commands would come from specific information that's derived from being proactive. And you would agree with me that, that one's mere presence in a high crime area does not subject them to commands and required compliance with the law enforcement. I'm going to object, Judge, just to legal conclusion. Mm -hmm. Overall, answer it if you can. I can tell you what we train officers to do. Hypothetically, mere presence is not sufficient for a person to be stopped just because they happen to be in some particular location. Mm -hmm. In terms of location, you gave an example before about kind of where there are aberrations of the baseline. Do you recall that? But I do, yes. Okay. And I think the example that you gave was the, the church on Sunday morning, right? Yes. In the church on Sunday morning, the baseline for that you know, assuming that they hold services on Sunday morning would be a, a room full of people, right? Yes. Perhaps a, a message going on or a song going on. Yes. Okay. And you can apply that baseline to other places like a parking lot, right? I'd apply the baseline everywhere, yes. Sure. So a ba things that you'd expect to see in a parking lot to a apartment building would be cars, correct? Yes. People in those cars. Sometimes, I mean, it depends on, we get into the hour, we get into if it's a high crime area, things like that. Um, so I think there are other factors that go in besides just the fact that there are cars and there are people who typically drive them. Okay. And, and I think um, you, you have characterized Mr. Oth, Mr. Oth Wallace as being suspicious just because he was in that vehicle. I'm not sure I did that. You, you're not characterizing just Otho Wallace's mere presence in that vehicle as being suspicious. So again, I'm not privy to all the information that the officer had. I think the officer thought he was suspicious because he decided to exit his vehicle. Now, he could have been there. You need to stop there. We need to remain objective on this. Not subjective. Right, um, I'm just asking for your objective opinion. I mean, you've been called here to render an opinion by the state of Florida. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you would agree with me that you believe that that individual in the vehicle would cause a minor amount of suspicion. What are you doing there? It's dark. You're all alone. What's happening? Just I'm going to object as to specifics in this case. Could, might I ask for a legal basis beyond specifics to the, the case? Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I proceed? You testified before that Mr. Wallace was startled. He appeared to be startled to me. And uh, certainly you would advise your, uh, your criminal uh, law enforcement students to take into account the way in which an office, a, a citizen would react to the act, their actions, right? No, it's not true. Yeah, you're you're yeah. gone. Speak on. That's not true. Well, maybe I, I probably asked a poor question. Maybe let me ask it this way. Um, wouldn't you agree that in connection with your lectures, you would tell your officers you need to be observant of the people that you're dealing with, right? You would observe their behavioral cues. Yes. Okay. Um, and certain cues that you're looking for 
uh, could potentially suggest involvement in criminal behavior. It's possible. And you have things that people can do with their hands that might suggest criminal behavior. Yes. Things that people can do with the way that they're speaking that might be consistent with criminal behavior. Yes. Okay. And there are ways that a person would act if they are being falsely suspected of something. Would you agree with that? Object, <laughs> uh, to speculation outside the scope of the threat. I'll let him answer. Answer the question. Yeah. I mean, I don't think an officer would know if they're being falsely um, accused of something. I mean, for example, if it's a approach to Mr. Wallace because maybe Rainer has in his head that maybe this is a medical emergency or maybe he's operating behind the wheel of a car because he's intoxicated. I mean, I don't know what he's thinking. But approaching him is not inconsistent with police training. Approaching him, talking to him, finding out what's going on, trying to develop a baseline for the parking lot at that moment, I think was appropriate. That's what, exactly what we would train officers to do. But certainly you would agree with, with me when you're teaching your students, you would never tell them officers in training it is completely reasonable for you to think that if you go up to someone and falsely accuse them of something that they will have no negative interaction towards you at all they wouldn't be startled they wouldn't be scared they wouldn't be frustrated there's some kind of yeah, speculation about some of oh you can answer if you can um, so again, I, I take some exception with the idea of reasonable because I think that is a judgment call after the fact. That being said, it is appropriate for officers to approach people and we do tell them that sometimes their behavior is unpredictable, particularly when we pull cars over. Sometimes people get all panicked when they're behind the wheel of a car. They may not go to the side of the road like we expect. They may cut across lanes. Who knows? So I think officers are, are cued in on the idea that an approach to somebody will have some consequence in their reaction. What that consequence is, is unpredictable until it happens. But if it's consistent with criminality, law enforcement officers are also trained to recognize that. So confronting someone who's doing some, nothing wrong might result in an unpredictable response. Yeah, I would say that's true. Thank you. Redirect. Say it again. Oh, yeah, that's fine. It's okay. Because I don't have any questions at all. All right. Can you uh, yes, sir. fix the screen? All right. May the witness be excused. State? Uh, yes, sir. Fence? No. Okay, you're released. Thank you very much. All right, state, call your next witness. Yes, sir. This is a procedural that have a procedural uh, stop that I have to take at this moment. I have to step into the area. All rise, from the jury. <laughs> Folks, I'm going to give you five minutes. Okay, I'll be back here in five minutes. All right. Uh, do we have a motion from the defense? Yes, Defense make a motion for uh, judging the acquittal of first time the premeditation. As you know, it's uh, more than a mere intent to kill. It must uh, the fully formed conscious purpose to kill. The purpose to kill must exist for a sufficient length of time to permit the nature of the act to be committed and the probable result of that act. Based on the video, we can see that um, there was no premeditation. Uh, Mr. Wallace, all he did was react to a situation he was thrust into by the illegal activity of um, Mr. Rainer, and so therefore there was no premeditation. They're trying to get it in through some posts that were done almost a month prior to this incident, and those posts had absolutely nothing to do, nor were there any, uh, any uh, indication of Mr. Wallace's state of mind as to the time of the incident. As for the felony murder, it's evident from the uh, the, um, the video that uh, Mr. Rayner was not acting in good faith, thereby making his actions unlawful. Based on Rayner's actions, Mr. Wallace had the authority to resist and defend himself because he felt that he was reasonably in danger. 
And therefore, JL should be guided by Mountain as well. Okay, a brief response. Your Honor, uh, as far as premeditation, the post before and after, uh, as well as the video and what happened in that video, all established premeditation. Uh, the state has done that. Of course, in life most favorable at this point as well. And as far as uh, the right to use force, uh, there's been there's been no testimony at this point regarding that. I would say that there's excessive force. The video speaks for itself. Best evidence, and therefore, the motion should be done. All right, the standard of uh, a review at this point in time is the, the court to view the evidence in the light most favorable to the state. Uh, based upon uh, that standard, I'm going to find that there's sufficient evidence for the jury to consider the case and render a verdict in this case, and then the state has proven a prima facie case at this point in time. The motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. Um, did, you, did you say you have something you're going to present or no? Yes, I'm doing just uh, more for the record, not this being being granted, but we would uh, assert the record of motion for mistrial based upon the court's denial, um, specifically this time in reference to the uh, testimony of Mr. Guard at our special hearing. Okay, the motion for mistrial will be denied. The court's ruling stands. Um, uh, in terms of the scheduling thing, yes, Your Honor, we do have some um, exhibits that we're going to present and we may have some testimony as well. So okay. In terms of the timing, Maybe, uh... Well, I'm going to keep going right now. Okay. Um, but because I may not get a chance, uh, Mr. Wallace, we've had uh, conversations about uh, taking the stand or not taking the stands for uh, two days now. And now comes the time uh, where I have to ask you those questions, whether or not you've had the opportunity to discuss the decision as to whether or not you want to testify or you don't want to testify with your lawyers. Have you, have you done that? And have you given uh, thought to whether or not you want to testify or you don't want to testify? And have you made a decision whether or not you want to testify or you don't want to testify? And what is your decision? You want to testify. Now, you remember, we had this discussion that previously you had been, um, I, I told you that you'll be able to tell the jurors, you know, what you want to say, but that you'll be vigorously cross-examined. You understand that? Okay, and that you made that decision freely and voluntarily, correct? Did, did anybody threaten you or force you or course into making that decision? Did anybody promise you anything uh, for making that decision? Okay, I, uh, and obviously you're not under the influence of any alcoholic beverages or controlled substances. Okay, then uh, I respect your decision. Oh, it's, it's okay. The court reporter took down the answers. So that microphone, you have to push down to talk in order to, to pick, pick up the PA. That's okay. That's fine. The court reporter took the answers. All right. So we're ready for the jury? Your Honor, just maybe procedurally makes sense now uh, to give the state an opportunity to have any objection. We have a few exhibits that we're going to introduce. I'm just saying specifically, it would, would be the court clerk to take any objections to those now and let the jury stop. I don't know. Is there objections? I, I don't know what they're referring to. If I just talk. No. Yeah. Warren camera on a trail, which we've talked about. We certified that. Um, I know if I find it through the files, I believe there's an objection to that. Um, we have a few photographs that we believe were authenticated. We moved those out. I don't believe there's an objection. Um, we also have still shots of frame by frame stills, which by stipulation were agreed to admit. And I think the only matter of contention is our desire to introduce body worn camera footage from uh, Amanda Dibbins, essentially 30 minutes, an hour before uh, the interaction on uh, video with Opal and Jason Rayner. And in that video, she has a very brief exchange with uh, Mr. Rayner. They don't, they don't talk at all. Uh, the purpose of that would be um, uh, effectively to provide the 
more information on the, the, the bias and credibility of the testimony of Ms. Dan, where she said at a prior time she was very certain that it happened um, at this trespass location, and uh, the video shows otherwise. And in, in terms of the relevance, that would be the relevance in terms of the admissibility of uh, believe that she has uh, not only authenticated it when she was testifying, but also we have that Okay. Judge, uh, two things. First off, uh, Officer Davidson, she already admitted that she didn't make that statement at that time. So there's no extrinsic evidence is admissible. Once a witness admits on the stand that they made a mistake or they lied or they were inconsistent, you can't put any evidence in. So that's the first rule you can't get past. Secondly, it's all pure statement, Judge. It's just conversation with an urban officer. But Officer Davidson already, already admitted. Okay. Um. Well, it's not hearsay. It's not offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So th that that doesn't fly. Um, there's no statement on the table, Your Honor. There's no, that's the point. There's no conversation in the video at all. Okay, well, I mean, are we going to play 30 minutes of nothing? 30 seconds to a minute of the video. Oh, okay. I'll overrule the objection if you want to. Um, I, Even though the witness already admitted she didn't say it at that point? I, I think they're entitled to show proof that, you know, they're consistent with their position. That she didn't say, at least on that one instance, I don't know what other instances that there are, you're free or free to argue. Uh, there might have been another instance, you know, another communication, whatever it might be. That's argument for the jury. But I think they're entitled to, to put whatever they want to do to demonstrate that at least in that one instance, there was no communication regarding the stolen vehicle. I think that's what it shows, right? Security is in balance. So you can't put extrinsic evidence once a witness admits it. Unless they have a case that speaks differently, all the case law is clear. Once a witness admits on the stand for it, then you can't put extrinsic evidence to prove it. Okay. So that's what they're doing. I'll allow it. Thank you. Anything else? So that's the only objection, correct? Yes, sir. The rest of it is stipulated, too? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, just proceed early, Judge. Um, I don't think we have a desire at this point in time to actually publish the evidence to the jury. We just wanted to see the court have any issue with that. I just, we would go on the record to admit those, and then you, you take it. You know, out of fairness to the jurors, at least say, admit this item and then stipulate to you know what it may depict so they know what to look for otherwise you know i don't know how many items of that evidence are we up to now but uh That's exactly where I was asking. okay well but there's an agreement as far as what it might be in there i mean sometimes the description becomes objectionable too and, and i know just this is exactly where i brought it up because i don't think it would ever be appropriate for an attorney in this context to argue to the jury but what, all that i wanted to say was you know the defense at this point in time by virtue of stipulation admits this Piece of evidence which is the axon on trail. That That's fine. Something to that effect. I just wanted to make sure that was okay. That'd be fine. Okay. Obviously, the description is something that is inconsistent with what you believe it is. You're welcome to stand up and I'll allow you to say it. Okay. Anything else? We're ready for the jury? Hold on. Hold on. We need to set up our computer in the state state, okay, the one that is up here. Set up your computer? Yeah. Okay. We have one. Computer. Yeah. Defense, you have an objection to that? No, I think it's in line with the rule. Okay. It's one. This is two. Mm -hmm. This is two. Do we have these? Let me know when you're ready. Okay, if you want to figure just just keep them going. Yes, sir. Oh, take him. Bill. I'm sorry, um, Bill. Wait, 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 wait. They, they, they have to uh, take Go ahead. He needs to go to the restroom. Take him. The jury is present. You may be seated. Uh, the state has rested. Defense? Your Honor, this time the Catholic Wallace. Where's this? You'll raise your right hand, please. Yes. You'll come around here, please. Show 
Witness is seated, Your Honor. Make sure you speak loud and clear so the jurors hear what you have to say. Sir. You may proceed. Good morning. Would you introduce yourself to the jury? My name is Otto Hollis, C-H-A-L-W-A-L-L-A-C. And uh, oh, just a little bit up. Sometimes it picks up your breathing, but um, where are you? get close. Thank you. And Otho, where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Gainesville. Uh, later, I moved to Daytona Beach, Volusia County. Then I stayed in the land for a while and moved to Broward County. Then I moved back to Daytona. And back on uh, June 23rd of 2021, where were you living? I was living in Daytona Beach. And what was the address? 133 Kingston. Okay. Now, um, were you working at that time? Yes, I was. Where were you working? Uh, at the McDonald's off of Bevel Road in Daytona Beach. Okay. And back on June 23rd of 2021, did you work that day? Yes, I did. Okay. And what were your hours that day? Uh, I was to go, I was to open, so I went in about a little after 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, and uh, got off of shortly after 3.30, between 3 and 4. And after you got off work, what did you do? I drove home, as I always do. And then, how, were you, did you stay at home the rest of the night, or what did you do? Well, when I got home, I took a shower. Um, I had to go see my other kids. I have four kids that reside in the Volusia County area, two that were that were where I was living and two lived with them. that um my other kids mom lived over in Deltona so I had to go to see them in Deltona and I'm just trying to split the time share my time with all my kids and I, and I probably should ask you who all lived with you at 133 Kingston Um, uh, my two daughters uh should I say the name you don't have to I uh, want my two daughters and my girlfriend at the time Taisha and uh how long were you out seeing your other children? I had left after I took a shower, so after like 4.30 or 5 maybe, and then I didn't come back until like a little after 8.30. Okay. All right. And uh, you've seen everything, that you know, the video and everything, um, and obviously you were there, but, you know, when you got home back to your apartment, what were you, what were you doing in your vehicle? I was just sitting in my vehicle. I was listening to music. I had taken a phone call and I just went back to listening to music and just relaxing and smoking my cigar. Were you ever aware of uh, a vehicle pulling into the uh, the parking lot area? I noticed lights uh, because I was just sitting there and it was, it was fairly dim in the parking lot in the back at that time. So I was just sitting there and I noticed the lights and I didn't, I didn't notice the vehicle just about until it was in front of me, like in front of my car. Would it be safe to say you were preoccupied with what you were doing? Yeah, I was just minding my business. I was when okay. And at some point, did you notice uh, Jason Rayner walking towards your vehicle? I noticed the, I noticed the individual with a flashlight. I didn't know it was Jason Rayner, but I did notice the flashlight and it startled me a bit and I was kind of like nervous and just caught off guard. So I was looked up to see what was going on. And when you noticed the flashlight, where was it shining? It was directly in my face. I was just about blinded from. Um, when, from the time that the, you noticed the flashlight in your face to the time that Jason Rayner was at your vehicle, approximately how long did that take? It was, it was Quick, like 10 seconds, almost, I would say, just about immediately. And as, as Jason Rayner approached, what were you doing in your vehicle? I was like, I was getting, I had already opened my door because I was prepared to get out the car as I usually do to go in the house. So I was just gathering all my things that I basically had stuff on my lap and uh, I was just kind of collecting, overseeing the car before I get out and just getting ready to go in the house. I, I already had the door open. Yeah. And so you had one leg out and you were starting to stand up, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I was yeah, I was in the motion of getting just getting out of the car. Right. And as you were getting out, did you see Jason Rayner in close proximity to you at that time? At, yeah, as I was getting out, by the time I that made it to stand up, he was like just about in my he was like in the car door, in the area of the car door and making his way in between like the the opening of the car and like me. Mm -hmm. 
And at that point, did you, were you, how did you feel when he was standing in that area, I guess? I, like I said, I was already like nervous and kind of surprised, a little shaken up because I didn't know who it was and I'm not, you know, used to nobody approaching me back there. So I was, I was nervous and confused a little, like, you know, caught off guard. And how tall are you? I'm um, 5'7". And uh, was uh, Jason Rayner taller than you? Um, about four or five inches, yes, sir. Now, when Jason Rayner was standing, I guess, between uh, the car door and the car, did you, did you feel at that time you were free to leave? No, no, sir. It wasn't even space for me to leave at all. But is that the only reason you didn't feel like you could leave is because of the space or no, I mean, anything else? I was, I was shocked and I realized like, you know, he's right there. So I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't move. I was locked in and I was kind of like, you know, going off and what's, what's going on with this situation. Did you ever try to leave? I, I did. When I stood up, I attempted to like, you know, kind of move around, but I, he was right there so close I couldn't I couldn't go anywhere so that's at that point I okay I, I would I would, before, I'm a, can I go back a little bit kind of in the past okay I I went to uh I got I'm a licensed security guard in the state of Florida so I had to take that a non responsive just to, why I mean I'd asked you about whether or not you felt you could leave or why you, you tried to leave okay well I, I couldn't leave he was standing in the doorway. Okay. And uh, how many times did you try to leave during this incident? I made three efforts to like walk away, and it happens very fast. But and and I'll try to explain. But I made three efforts, and that I can remember. Right. And did you ever find out as to why you were put in between your car door and your car, and unable to leave? I never got an answer as to why I wasn't able to leave. And uh, as far as Jason Rayner's actions, um, was he asking you questions or what was going on? I recall him saying something to the effect of, hey, how's it going? Do you live here? And I was just like, what's going on? Was it, was it really dark at that time or was it just becoming dark? It was it was newly becoming dark. Right. And uh, while you're put in, in between your car and the door, what was going through your mind? Like I said, I was already confused and, and caught off guard by the unsuspected presence of him in between my door. Way like all of a sudden, so I was I was beginning to get scared, and it like immediately. He began to like put his eight arms on me and stuff, so I didn't know what was going on. I didn't have an answer to my question, so I was confused as to like what's taking place in this situation. Here. Why didn't you just sit down as uh, you were instructed? I didn't know what was going on, and I wanted to know what was going on, but I also do know my rights, so I, I, I felt that I had the freedom to leave. And. Uh... Why didn't you just tell him that you live there? I asked him a question to try to figure out what was the, try to get some insight of the context of why we, what's going on. And I thought that it was a fair question, being he's a, the law enforcement officer. So upon approach, I just asked him what's going on. I never got an answer, but I just asked what's going on. I mean, was there ever any conversation between the two of you? Not. Nah. Not besides my question and his demands, that was it. And at what point did everything escalate? It began to escalate at the point of when he started to put his, his he had his uh, hand on my shoulder, as you can see in the video. And when I, when I made like an effort to kind of like shimmy my way between the space that I had to move and like where he had his hand, he put his other hand on my hand. That's when, like I say, I, I don't want to go into it, but I, I want to be able to explain why I held my forearm out. And that's something I learned in security school is when you want to make distance with somebody or create a space to move 
if like anybody have ever seen like celebrities walking through a crowd of people they have bodyguards and they they kind of walk through with their forearm out not in like a way to like hit anybody or cause force but if you bump into the forearm it's a safe barrier to kind of create that space so that's what i attempted to do when i just kind of like like held my forearm out to get if you look on the video the door is open and he's standing there so if i can hold my forearm out i can create a space where i can maneuver because i don't want to become physical with him i'm just trying to kind of make my way out of this small space that was that i found myself in and at that point were you fearful at all i was most definitely fearful because i didn't i didn't know what was going on i hadn't had answers to my questions and i was just trying to see like what, what's going to happen here i never ever in my life been in that situation and it, that was kind of like one of my worst fears is being in a situation like that in the dark with no witnesses nobody to see what's going on and no nothing to like really bring any awareness to the situation your honor we're going to play the video and i was going to ask if they carved a lot for mr wallace to come down here and okay did you we know what exhibit is your plan it's it 12. It's, 12. it's the the real time video you remember? Okay. You may step down. States Exhibit 12. How's it going? Do you live here? What's going on? Do you live here? Why are you asking? What's going on? Sit down. Sit, 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 sit. Sit, sit, sit. What's, sit. Sir. Can you sit down? I'll talk to you. Okay. Down. Come on, now. Sit. Come on, now. Don't do this. Sit down. Why are you asking me to go out there? Do you live here? Yes or no? What's going on, though? I'm cool. Charlie 777. No, back up. Stop. 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 Stop, man. If we could back it up. Okay, right here's a good spot. At, at this point here, you testified earlier that the, the light was in your eye. Yes. What's going on right here? Right in this particular situation is when I noticed the light and I'm, I'm a little confused or I see it. I'm not used to people coming up to me at this time of night. And I was kind of just like all dark and a bit like shaking up. So I'm starting to be, become aware of this presence is it's guarding some type of uh, emotion that was that would make me feel kind of scared right now. I was like, Can we go to the point where the door is open soon. Okay, at, at this point right here, explain, I guess, where you are in relation to um, Mr. Rayner, because obviously we can't see him. Okay, well, just imagine like the hood of the car and the door in the driver's seat. At this point, I had just stood up. So when you're getting out of the car, you are not being turned sideways. It's like a normal motion. So as I'm getting up, I'm, I'm turned, side, turned sideways. And he's basically right here. And that's when he, you can see his arm on my shoulder. And my hand, like, it, when I'm getting out of the car, my, my phone was on my lap, so it was kind of sliding down. And I'm always aware that I have cracked many phones by just standing up. So. I always like kind of grab, you know, grab whatever's on my lap, and that's what I was doing. And um, in, in the in the picture, I saw, you know, I checked my phone over. And you said that his hand was on it. Was that just a soft touch, or was it a forceful touch, or what was going on? This initial touch is what stopped my first uh, effort to walk away. This is what this is the first. If you see right, okay, I can't really see the screen is big. Can I take a particular step? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the screen is kind of big. So at this point, you can see, when you go back, you can see what my shoulders chest. But I can't, now I realize I don't have my freedom to, to walk away right now. And that, Sir, can you sit down? I'll... That's what I was going to ask you. At that point, did you feel as though you were free to walk away? No, I knew I wasn't because the only way to walk away was to basically like go through him or go some way around him. Okay. Can you go a little bit further? Come on, now. Sit. Come on, now. Don't do this. Sit down. Why are you asking me to do that? All right. And, hey, wait. 
We can't talk if the video is playing. And we can't both talk at the same time, okay? Only one thing at a time. Let me ask the question. Go back just a little bit. Right. And if you if you were unable to, in your mind, leave when there was one hand on your shoulder, how did you feel when the second hand was placed on your other shoulder? If further my fear of what was what might take place between me and the individual at the time. If you look, the, he's, he's holding my shoulders, like pushing me, basically pushing me, and then he shifted, shifted me back towards the way, with, which was kind of far to the seat. I was sitting directly on the driver's seat. So that's kind of what's taking place in the Move forward. In the um, frame. How long ago I live here? Do you live here, yes or no? What's going on, though? Now, at that point, you hear him radio, you know, go to his radio, takes his left arm off you, and that's when you bring up your left um, forearm. And uh, why, at that point, did you make a more conser concerted effort to leave? Because for various amount of reasons, I hadn't, I hadn't had any answers to any of my questions. I'm, I'm scared as I can possibly be. There's no witnesses. So now I'm thinking that, that this is going to call somebody else. So I don't know. I didn't do anything. I wasn't, you know, breaking the laws. I had just been sitting and minding my business. So now it seems like, like there's a lot to be more people to, to come assist him with whatever he finna do to me. And I don't know what's going on. Nobody has answered any of my questions. I, I, I'm 10 feet away from going to, into my apartment. I don't know what's going on. So I was, I'm, that was my effort to be like, okay, now, now I have to become a little more assertive in my effort to walk away. And that's when I held my forearm up. You just kind of try to make those things. Go up till it gets dark so you can't see. Stop. Stop. Okay, now at this point, you really can't see what's going on from the video, right? How close were you and Jason Rayner at that point? We was, we was just about chest to chest because he was, he, was he was pulling me towards him and like we was kind of shifting and like kind of spinning around. It was, it was like a, like I'm, it, basically if you grab somebody and, and you have a lot grip on them and you kind of shifting around, the space is so small, like there's nowhere really for us to go. So we just about chest to chest. Okay. Did you continue to try to get away from him? I was pulling away as I'm like trying. I'm I'm not in um like I'm not trying to get any closer. I'm pulling away the whole time. I'm trying to like pull away, but he, you know, his he got me by both hands just about, and you know that's how I'm like so close to him. Yeah, that, that was going to ask. Did he still have you with both of his hands? Yeah, at some point, but then it, and then at some point. Were you able to get away from his, would be his right hand? Yes, I was. And, and how did that happen? Well, he, he like, he was lost, I'm not sure if he lost grip or just moved his hand, but when he, when his hand did move, so I'm, like, imagine this is my shoulder, and like, it's a pulling motion. So when his hand did move, he started to, like, make movements towards his waistband, and I was starting to look and trying to, like, Let's go. Let's go back a little. As as you were trying to walk away just before it gets dark, where did he have a hold of you? Yeah, on my shoulder and my arm. And what? When you say shoulder, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, but now at this point, he his hand is on my shoulder, but his grip is on my shirt at the shoulder portion of my shirt. That's what I'm. Was he pulling on your shirt? Yes. Now this in this frame, if I would have been able to, to walk away, it would have been like a it would have been like a motion like this. Like, I can't really do it because I got a suit on, but it would have been more of a, a yoking type of motion. Had I, it would have been, if I, it would have been more, my head would have like been taken back by that motion. Now, when we get forward again where, the, where it's dark, once he was released when his right arm let go of you, mm -hmm. what maneuver or what motion did you make at that point to try to get away? So, his right arm came off of me, but this my shoulder. So if you reverse this position, 
it would like if you reverse it, it would be like this. So when when he dropped his right arm, I kind of like to try to make an effort to duck under it because if I could have got his right arm to go over my head, I would have been able to put him behind me, and then I would have created like that space of freedom to get away from him or whatever it was going on. And then did you notice anything when you ducked down to go under his arm? Right. When I ducked down, he kind of like shimmy his elbow and was making a, a reaching um, motion towards his waistband. And that's, at that point, I was like, you know, something, this is not going to go right for me. And I started, like, basically, like, there was, there was a, a deep sense of fear that my most, you know what I mean, most, uh, excuse me, um, the thing that I feared the most was probably happened to me right there. So how, and you said you saw his hand go towards his waistband? Yes. All right, and uh, in response to that and your fear, what did you do? That's when I like, made an effort to get around, but when he moved, he still had, he still had, I can't really do it without extra body, but okay. it's hard to, so his arm is on me, right? And I'm trying to get under, imagine this arm is, is on me, I'm trying to get under it. I'm trying to get under it, but he, his elbow goes like this, so I can't, but when I'm doing it, his right arm is making that motion. When he makes that motion, that's when I, I, I threw my fire arm and I, kind of, I couldn't get under his own arm. I kind of dug, when I dug and I fired, it just went off at like, right at my ear. And that's when like, he was, he was in like a moving type of motion and he fell backwards and I like stung with that because he lost his grip on my shoulder. All right, and then, keep going. Stop. Stop, man. Okay. And uh, you hear you say something at the end. Do you recall what you said? I was, I, I was in like a, a state of adrenaline, so I was basically, like, I, I think I said something, I get the fuck back or something like that. Okay. All right. You can sit back then. How do you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, we've uh, we've all seen those uh, Instagram posts that uh, came out in early June. Um, were they a part of your Instagram account? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, and there's the one that references uh, pig's blood. Um, and you also make reference to many. What what was that in response to? Um. The, the the pig pig's blood statement was um the this probably the stupidest decision I ever could have made when when it comes to me uh venting to to the things I was frustrated about. But um at the time it was a lot going on in our country. People, you know, was getting killed and it was unfortunate lots of unfortunate situations taking place and um I'm not sure if the many of the jurors are familiar with social media, but I'm kinda one of those people that whip my Part on my sleeve when it comes to expressing myself on the internet. So a lot of times I get on there and just say stuff like meaninglessly or just I'm one of those people that's quick to make comments about things, you know, whether it's true or not, I just cast my opinion. So that was kind of basically what was going on, but it was just a reflection of, you know, what I was feeling and going through at the moment about what was taking place all over the country with these unfortunate incidents. Can I just get you to stop there? Disengage the computer from the screens. Did I, did I, yeah, push the button. Yeah. Okay. Proceed. All right, what about the uh, the post with uh, regarding John and Bolton? What was this about? The, the situation with uh, Johnny Bolton is a guy that was killed by a SWAT team in uh, Powell County, Georgia, uh, no knock warrant. And uh, I just, I, I felt really bad for the incident that took place and I, again, like I say, you know, I made a bunch of comments online 
about things taking place in the country. And that was one of those comments that I had made just out of frustration for what took place. I was, you know, I was feeling, you know, much compassion and sentiment that his family was expressing online. And I just, I was just saying stuff, you know, just making, making my frustrations known and whatever way. Were, were these posts in any way a manifesto for you? You know, like, this is what I'm going to carry out. This is what I'm going to do. No, they were just, they were just things I said out of frustration. Because I just, I'm just overly expressive sometimes. If, uh, if you could, would you have deleted those posts? Yeah, but unfortunately I couldn't. I, I, I wasn't able to delete them. I but, do that often when I regret saying things or realize how stupid it was. I just delete it. It happens. Mm -hmm. Was it ever your desire to have a run-in with law enforcement? No, sir. No, sir. What, you know, and again, you kind of explained, but what were these posts? What, why were they there? Like I say, you, um, if you, the other content, there's a lot of content on my IG page. And I'm one of those people, like I said, I'm very expressive or overly expressive and I get upset or whatever. So sometimes I vent about things online, Instagram. I'm one of those people that make comments on YouTube and, you know, whether you could call it trolling or not, or just, you know, like over, over, overly expressive person, but I'm kind of one of those people. So you'll find if you knew me or was on Instagram, I'm just, it's my life, somebody else's life or neighbors. I'm always just kind of just talking about things and just expressing my opinion, just whether it's relevant or whether anybody can connect with it. I just, I just do it. That's just something I do when I'm in my leisure time on social media. So I, I noticed that I have a few young jurors, but I'm not sure if y'all use social media to understand the use of it. But a lot of people tend to get online and just freely express themselves, whether it's relevant, whether people can connect. It's just something. Objective and narrative. Sustain. Just. Sorry. You're good. You're good. Um, later on, after this incident, there was uh, an audio post. Um, when uh, when was that posted? Later on, as in. The, on, on June 23rd of 2021. Um, the post after the situation? Yes. Um, well, there was an audio recording, and I was just, again, being overly expressive about my frustration at the situation I had just found myself in, and I was just just frustrated. And I was kind of, I was, I wasn't, I was it really in a state of panic, and I was kind of still in that adrenaline state where I thought that, this is this this is over with. There's no way in the world that I'm gonna get my last message out because I was driving and I was expecting something to happen like a pit maneuver or my car to be, you know, stopped and shot up or something like that. So I was it was kind of a last ditch effort to get the message to anybody that was on my social media. Okay. Um that night were you uh were you hoping or were you trying to make those posts a reality? No. I was just I was just sitting in my car, relaxing, minding my business. And what? Why did you pull your fire in? Because at the, in the moment there was no, I felt in that moment there was no other way I can get out of this situation. There's, I'm in a situation with I don't know what's going on, and I tried my hardest, and I gave a genuine effort to try to gain an understanding. And I said, you know, what's going on? And after I realized there's a, you know, there's a situation outside of my control, you know, I just did what I could to survive the encounter because I didn't know, you know, how it was going to end for me after I realized, you know, him going for his waistband. And why was, why was the firearm in your pocket? Well, I, I, when I leave in the morning for work, I get up early. So I always get up and put my firearm, it has a sleeve holster and I put it in the glove compartment of my car. So as I said before, I was already getting out of my car and I was, that's one of the first things I grabbed to make sure that I don't forget it in the vehicle. So I grabbed it and I put it in my pocket and as I was getting ready to get out the car, it was already in, in my pocket. And uh, I guess in your mind, how certain were you that you had to react the way you did? There was nothing else I could do. I was back in the corner, I tried to leave. I tried my hardest to get an understanding. You know, I've seen, I seen him reaching for his, you know, waistband where I, where I know that there's, you know, multiple amounts of weapons that could be used to cause, you know, me harm or, or death. 
and and being in this situation, I'm not sure how people, it, you know, how other people would react. But I, in my in my perception, I felt that this was the only option I have after I had tried everything else. You know, there was no other effort that I could have put into walking away safely, and that was the best thing I could have did to to preserve you know my being. One second, yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I don't have anything else at this point. Folks, I understand this is a lunch hour, but I think I'd like to keep going. Uh, does anyone need to eat a snack before we keep going or use the restroom? State cross-examination. Yeah. Yes, sir. State, uh, you, I already ruled on the marijuana issue, so there's no need to repeat that. Well, what is the next proffer that you had at the, at the sidebar? Yes, Judge. Um, you may be seated. Thank you. Mr. Wallace indicated he's never been in this position before, never been in a situation late at night with an officer by himself. There's uh, 17, I said 14, it's 17 other interactions with law enforcement where he either received a notice to appear or was arrested, Judge. Yeah. You Yes, sir. Your Honor, he's not a convicted felon. As far as impeachment goes, yes, he's ever been convicted of a felony or a crime and just been involved in the felony. When he's talking about I've never been in this situation, he's talking about I've never been in a situation where I'm doing nothing wrong to get out of my car and I'm back into a corner. Not that he's never had an interaction with law enforcement in the past. It's all about that. I've never had an incident where something like that has happened and he felt that his life was in danger. And like I said, we can impeach him on if he's ever been, if he's a predicted felon, how many, and whether or not he's ever had any problems with uh, this offense. We can go into all these other acts as any proper character evidence that were filed in the motion, the Williams rule, and it's. And Judge, the state normally wouldn't file a Williams rule. We don't know if the defendant's going to testify. And once they open the door, it's fair game for us to address that situation. His answer gives the inference that he's never had any sort of interaction with law enforcement. Um, that is misleading to the jury. Uh, however, to get into 17 specific instances would be overly prejudicial. So unless you can call back your question, I'm not really sure. I can ask if he's had interaction with law enforcement and he knows how to behave with law enforcement. He's had times where he's been with them and he's behaved appropriately. Well, <laughs> that's an open-ended question, which I, I know he probably doesn't know how to answer that based upon what the limitations are for impeachment. Uh, the standard rule for impeachment is that he ever been convicted of a felony, ever been convicted of a crime involving the making a false statement or dishonesty. That's normal impeachment. His state of mind is at issue, and he claims that at the time, he he never been in that situation. So what would your question, proffer your question to me if I was Mr. Wallace? Yes, sir. Judge, there's, uh, he made a specific statement. He's never been at night in a parking lot or somewhere dark where no one else has been around where law enforcement has interacted him. There's at least two or three incidences where I would go into it where it was late at night. He was arrested by law enforcement and everything was fine. And there was no issue. It was an all, one officer who arrested him in that instance. He knows the facts better than I do, Judge. So I would just go into certain instances where you say that you've never been in a, in a situation before with an officer late at night. That's incorrect, isn't that, sir? In fact, on this date at 1.30 in the morning, you were arrested by a law enforcement officer. It was dark at night. Okay, no, I don't want to get, let you get into the arrest part, that he had interaction with law enforcement, okay. that the interaction resulted in an amicable or a resolution to the case without resorting to the use of violence. But we're not going to use the words, uh, words arrest. Uh, certainly there's no convictions, so, and that just establishes the, the state of mind at the time. Yes, sir. Based upon his answer that he... You know, he had never been in this situation before. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, and I don't want you to say the nature of the charge either. I would not do it's that. It's just an interaction yes, sir. with law enforcement before and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Anything else that we need to, while well, the jury's out? I don't, I don't think so, Judge. I mean, I'll, if there's something close, I will obviously come sidebar before I do it. Yeah, I just asked the 
limit, because Dan is the one who's going to talk about it, and I stay and people just look as if those parades are around for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just organizing the different dates and, and bank times. I mean, I'll, I'll leave that alone. So bring the jury back. <clears throat> Actually, hold that door. Counsel, I don't know. I got a note. I'm assuming it came from a juror. I don't even, I don't even know who put this. 73? 33. When we in the room, a lot of the jury discuss the case when we're not supposed to. Please make them understand we cannot do this. It's brief, but it happens. You want me to do anything about it other than to instruct them again? I was just asking to instruct them. I just ask for a moment, Mr. Okay. Bring him in, my counsel. I'll rise with the jury. Let me just. Maybe see it. Folks, I want to emphasize an instruction that I have given you because there are no there's no gray area to my wound, okay? You are not to discuss this case at all. That means nothing when you go into the jury room until I allow you to do it. I have to trust that you will follow my instruction. And I'm banking on you that you will follow the rules. So please do not utter any words that relate to anything that happens in the court while, you, while you're inside of the jury, okay? Thank you. State, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. Something became unplugged. came back. All right, I'll tell you what, do me a favor. Just move it just back a little bit. And I really want you to stay uh, at the podium, okay? Yes, sir. And if you can X out that whatever that is. Uh, uh, that's from Zoom itself. Thank you. You may proceed. Yes, sir. Mr. Wallace, when Officer Rayner, you keep referring to him as Jason Rayner, you knew he was an officer, right? I do know he's an, he was an officer, yes. Sir. Up. Yes, sir. All right, so when he approached you, he was in his uniform, correct? Yes. Yeah, he had a shiny badge? I didn't notice a shiny badge, but I'm, as, maybe, as a, okay, I'm sorry. Maybe he had one, but I didn't notice it. He knew he was a cop, well, a police officer, correct? Right? Yeah, at some point it, came, it became clear to me right. that he was an officer. Before, even hands on or anything, he knew he was a police officer, did you, sir? Before he put his hands on you. he put his hands on you and he stepped around the car and said, How you doing? Do you live here? As he approached you, you knew he was a law enforcement officer, didn't you, sir? I, I was blinded by the light, so I wouldn't have been able to see him until he was in the doorway. And that's when it became clear to me that this is a police officer. Right. And you, you saw the police car, though, in front of you, didn't you? I did see the police car. So policemen usually drive police cars, right? Yes. So it would be apparent to anybody that Officer Rayner was a police officer as he's approaching, correct? Yes. And you would agree with me that he asked you, do you live here? And you didn't respond, did you, sir? I did respond. I asked him what's going on. Wait, you didn't respond with an answer, did you? My answer was a question. I said, what's going on? Is that how people respond to questions, with other questions? I'm not sure. I can't speak for anybody but myself. 
Is that how you talk? So if someone asks you a question, you respond with the question and like on them? And depending on who I'm talking to, and if I feel like, you know, I should answer them without a question, I would just give them an answer. Right, so you didn't feel like you should have to answer Officer Rayner, did you, sir? I did feel like I should have to answer him, but the approach was, was what Garner, it was a natural reaction to just say what's going on. It wasn't a matter of me being defiant towards him. Isn't it true he asked you several times, do you live here? And none of those times did you answer, correct? It is true that he asked me that, yes. Right. And none of those times did you answer? No, I, did, I asked him what's going on. I answered right. him. And you what's never said Hey, I just live right across the street there, right? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. So you were non-responsive to a law enforcement officer just asking you some questions, correct? If you put it in that way, I, I didn't answer his question. You were evasive, a better word? No, I was not evasive. I was just simply asking him what's going on. That's what I would ask anybody if they approached me. Suddenly, I would just ask them what's going on if, if I was a bit confused as to why he was in front of me. So. If anybody approached you, you'd respond that way? Not differently with a police officer? No, I would just respond like that. If it could have been anybody, I could, what's going on? If you just suddenly walk up and you're immediately in my, 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 my personal space bubble, I would ask you what's going on. Like, you know, is, are you here to give me, a, do you need to tell me a secret? Or like, what, what's the need for the, 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 the close proximity is Correct. what I'm trying to find out. Did you ever say, what's the need for the close proximity? I asked him what's going on. I think that that would have been a more universal way of attempting to get an answer. After he asked you if you lived there, correct? Yes. Multiple times, correct? He did ask me that multiple times. And he also asked you to sit in the car multiple times, correct? Yes. And you didn't listen to him, did you? No. Right. Did, I did. You know, you're a security officer, right? Or you went to a security class? You yes. got training, correct? Yes. And as a security officer, when you were trained, you learned that people are supposed to respond when a person of authority Ask them to do something, correct? When I was a security officer, I never walked up on that anybody. The question is correct, yes or no? Ask me the question again, please. When you took this class and you got trained as a security officer, mm -hmm. you learned that people are supposed to respond when a person of authority, a law enforcement officer, a security officer, ask them to do something, correct? Yes, if, if, if it's reasonable. So in your training, they taught you, you only have to listen to a police officer or a security officer, if it's reasonable to the person who's hearing it? That's what you're telling us here? I, hold on, ask me that one more time. When you went through this training, right, as a security officer, okay. right, mm -hmm. you learned that you're gonna give commands to people and there's an expectation that they would listen to those commands, correct? Correct. Right, yet in this situation, after you received this training, mm -hmm. you didn't listen. You didn't respond to the law enforcement officer, did you, sir? I responded by asking him what is going on. Right, but he asked you direct questions. Mm -hmm. You can understand that late at night, right, if an officer sees someone in a parking lot and they're patrolling the area, that they might want to make sure that person lives there. You'd agree that's an appropriate thing for a law enforcement officer to do, right? Yes, I would agree in, in, in any other... In right, you, you live in that neighborhood, and if there's someone suspicious or someone who may not be there, you want the law enforcement officer to look into that and make a decision and see if that person belongs there, correct? I would want them to do that if, if they don't live there. Right, but how did Officer Rainer know you live there? You, you didn't tell him? I'm a regular res resident of the place. I park there every day. Uh, officer Rainer, who asked you a direct question, do you live here? How would he know you lived there? He wouldn't have known if I lived there. Right, because you wouldn't answer him, correct? I didn't give him an answer as to where I lived. No, I didn't. Right, because you were being invasive, right? You wouldn't answer any of his questions, correct? It was not an intention to be invasive. Okay. Well, when he asked you to sit down, that was evasive. You didn't sit down, did you, sir? No, I didn't. Right. In fact, you testified earlier under uh, direct that you had no other option but to kill Officer Rayner that night, correct? After, after there would have been a, a, a situation where I was pulled on, pushed on, and then where I was back in between the cars and the gate, and then I seen him reaching for his, uh, his waistband or whatever could have been on his waistband. Well, That's that in a minute, but you testified earlier that you had no other choice but to kill Officer Rayner that night, right? And it, after everything else I had tried, that, that had become the only option that seemed to, to be. Did you, did you try turning around and sitting in the car? 
Did I try to turn around and sit in the car? I asked you, ask you to do? I tried to walk away. Sir, that's not the question. You said you had no choices. Did you take yourself and sit yourself in the car when a law enforcement officer who you said from your training, you know you're supposed to listen to them, asked you to sit in the car? Well, he was pulling me at that point, so I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to sit down. Sir, at that point, he has his hand on your shoulder and he's saying, sit, 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 right? He's not right. pulling you at that point. No, he not. that video 50 times, correct? I, more than that. Right, and you would agree with me, at the point where he's asking you to sit, 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 he's only pushing you backwards actually to get you to sit down, correct? Right, but I'm trying to walk away because... But you said you had no choice uh, to do anything else. After that. everything I had, everything else I had to do, I've tried to do, that had become that that's what seemed to be the only option. But initially, are you asking me could I have sat down initially? You certainly could have, couldn't you? Yes. And you didn't, did you? No. Right. And you could have listened to the officer and told me you lived there, couldn't you? I could have. Right, but you didn't, did you? No, because I was trying to get an answer as to what was going on. Because you wanted to be in control of the situation, sir, correct? I wanted to know what was going on, most certainly. You wanted to be in control. You didn't want Officer Rayner to be in control, did you? It had nothing to do with it my efforts of being in control. I just wanted to understand what I was dealing with. Bro, if they come for me, it's a message to y'all, bro. I'm not gonna back down. Whose words are those? Those are my words on Instagram. Your words about police officers, correct? No, it's not about police officers. Really? Not just not that that message is not pertaining specifically police officers. I was just why don't we get into that then? You you sat through the trial, correct? I've been sitting. Yes, sir. I'm going to show you what's in evidence as states 45. I'll just stand up here, okay? Yes, sir. So let's read. One day, I will take great pride and honor in getting me some pig's blood on me. Were you talking about little pig lips? No, you were not talking about farm animals. Not specifically farm animals. You were talking about police officers, correct? Not, not just people. Of, not, not like just. I'm just talking. I'm just talking about people that don't see me as human. What people do you refer to as pigs? People who don't see me as human. So you were going to get pigs blood on my hands and boots. If you can't feel the enemy following me now, I'm going to be healthy for you. I pray against my enemy and I wish death to all. Right? That's your words. Yeah, but you didn't read it as it's poetic. Right? Well, let's go. But I want to go on. So, if you remember, you had been texting me with your friend, right? And mm -hmm. your friend actually sent a screenshot of this to you with you and told you you shouldn't be saying that because you're going to get your account closed down, correct? Oh, uh, he said something to the effect of that, sir? Yep. In fact, he says. Love you. I love you getting banned. That means he's afraid your account's going to get banned by what you're saying, correct? I'm assuming that's what he was intending. Well, you had a conversation with him. I said I'm assuming that's what he was getting at. What did you say to me? I just agreed and said I'm assuming that's what he was getting at. Right, and you said, fuck these crackers and their power of speaking to them. You didn't care, right? I'm talking about the people of Instagram who control, who have the power to shut down my Instagram. Right. That's what I'm talking about. And then you say, you're right, fam. That's why I've been not tagging my old tags. So you were avoiding tagging your old tags on your account, correct? Because you didn't want to get caught. Caught doing what? I was. Uh, you said it. Why I've been not tagging my old tag. Right. Meaning saying. You've been tagging things that were antagonistic and, and anti law enforcement, correct? No. I've been tagging other things that may have been. The reason why my, my Instagram got shut down had nothing to do with police officers in specific. Well, let's talk about that. You say, I'm tagging my old tag saying too much, bro. I want their blood, their blood, for what they've done in many. June, they killed another brother. 
Mm -hmm. who, who killed a brother in Minneapolis? There's been various situations that... Who, who are you referring to? You're talking about, okay, you have multiple situations... Mr. Wallace. Your Honor, let me answer. Personal specific phone to the I'm trying to... Let me this way. Okay. This statement right here was mm -hmm. a threat to police officers, correct? No, sir. Give me one other person in Minnesota who killed someone. I can't do that is over two years ago and I'm I don't may I'm can I answer? Sure. I made many comments on Instagram about things happening all over the country. I can't say specifically if that message was intended to to direct at police officers because it was so much stuff. I commented on a lot of stuff all the time and I just don't remember specific that being a direct uh at police officers. So no, I can't agree with you on that. So, as you sit here today, you're telling this jury that this wasn't in reference to police officers? No, sir. And when you say, I hate that, you're just saying, I hate anyone who... I'm talking about, people. I'm I talking hate. about the people, I'm, I'm re replying to multiple things going on in the text, going on in the chat. If you give me a chance to explain, there, he writes multiple times, and I'm commenting multiple times. We're having basically a two-fold conversation in one chat, and that happens on social media, which when you when you talking to people. So, and I could have been talking about uh, when they say I hate them. I'm talking about the people that be shutting down my page. That's not what it says. If you read the context of it, sir, it says, "But I love 100 percent." And then you say, "Fuck these crackers and the power on speaking to them." Yeah, but he also said something about me getting banned. Is Instagram a bunch of crackers? I'm not sure if it is, but... You refer to that as law enforcement officers, correct? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Well, you refer to law enforcement as a case, don't you? No, sir. In fact, after you killed Officer Rader or shot him, you went on Instagram and you posted that I, I'm not going to let these pigs do anything to me, correct? Say that to them. I said, I said, yes, I did refer to as pigs, but when I say the word pigs, I'm not specifically always talking about police officers. Well, she no. I'm talking about people who don't see me as human. Okay, so when you shot Officer Rader, you referred to him as a pig, and all the other people as pigs, the officers, correct? No, not just all. Not just when I said it again. I'm referring to people who don't see me as human. Sure. And then you go on and say, I hope they're listening. Fuck them, brother. You just don't know how close I am, bro. Right? Yeah, I'm talking again. I'm having a twofold conversation about the people who run the have the power to shut down pages at No, This is about you harming a law enforcement officer because it's in response to pigs and the blood, right? Isn't that I'm, having, sir? I'm having a twofold conversation in the chat. Where's your twofold? Yes, sir. I'm having a twofold conversation in him about what's about the post. But I'm also talking about the people who run Instagram. And if you understand how I conversate, uh, that happens with me a lot of times because I'm very expressive when it comes to comments and making, you know, things on Instagram. So that's kind of what's going on in that. So in this entire conversation, mm -hmm. I, I don't see your alternate conversation. You, you don't see where you're talking about me getting banned from Instagram? Right. If you read it, it progresses. You were going to get banned because you were posting about killing police officers. And he said, you better watch out. We need you to be out there, bro. We still need you to be around. And then you say, I don't give a shit. I don't care. I'm going to post what I want to post. Not true. Okay. And then further on your post, you say, I hope they're listening, meaning the police, because who else is going to be listening to you? I, I want to ask you, do you know if the police have an Instagram account that they specifically watch my page? I have no idea, sir. So how could they be? Well, why did you write that? Because Instagram monitors, and I'm, I'm frustrated with them. So I'm just referring to them specifically. So, so when you say, I hope they're listening, fuck it, brother, you just don't know how close I am. What, are you close to canceling your Instagram account? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm just so, frustrated, so I'm when just frustrated say, by so, we, so when you say, bro, if they come for me, it's a message to y'all, I'm not going to back down. So if they, if they take your stuff down, that's you're going to cancel your Instagram account? I'm not. You, you're talking about specifically that. Again, okay, I'm having a two-fold conversation. This is over two and a half years ago when this took place. So when you, when you read the comment, I'm trying to understand the exact context we was having. 
right? So read it one more time so I can, which comment are you talking about? Bro, if they come for me, it's a message to you all. Bro. Oh, yes, sir. In both of Yeah, Prussia. Yeah. Right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so when you said, "Bro, if they come for me, it's a message to y'all, bro. I'm not gonna back down." That was from Instagram. Was it from Instagram? No, you weren't gonna back down from Instagram. Is that what you're saying? I was gonna be. I was gonna be consistent with continuing to start more accounts. I'm not going to give up because they, because they cut one account. Okay. Let's talk about that night. You were possessing a firearm, correct? Yes. And you had it concealed in your mind, correct? Yes, I did. Right, and you didn't have concealed weapons from the page, sir. At the time, I, I had already plotted for concealed weapons. Did you have one at the time it, of this incident? No, I didn't. That's the answer then. Okay. Thank you. So you were actually not lawfully in possession of that firearm at the time, were you, sir? It was most definitely mine. I had bought it from a store. and. Were you allowed to possess a concealed firearm? Well, was I allowed to conceal the firearm that I possessed? And possess it on your bottom. Judge, your honor, that goes beyond the scope. He's asking for a legal question. He went to the security school and was trained. Wait, 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 wait. Great. Yes, sir. You went to security school, right? Yes. You learned when you can carry a concealed firearm, didn't you, sir? Yes. In fact, you were applying for a concealed weapon permit, correct? I had already applied. So you went through the process, right? Yes, I did. And you didn't have a concealed weapons permit at the time you had that firearm secreted or secreted on your side, correct? No, I didn't. It w I didn't have one, but I I had assumed that my application had been approved because I already had my license. You assumed it had approved? You had a license from the state of Florida? Okay, so you, license? So I had a security license. That's not my question. Did you have a concealed weapon from No, I didn't. Right. You knew that you couldn't possess that gun, didn't you, sir? Again, if you let me answer, I was going to answer that in my previous question. I had assumed that my application had been approved because these licenses, these types of licenses backpack on one another. If you don't have any felonies and you're legally able to possess a gun and you apply for a, a carry concealed or a G class, then you would, you would normally get, once you get approved for one, the motion of getting approved for others just s s smoothly like happens. It's not nothing that will prevent you because once you're deemed able to be a security guard, then you basically meet the other qualifications. So and I had assumed that I did already meet those qualifications. So yes. So you, 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 without any notification from the state of Florida, without any paperwork back, knowing you filled it out, which said you have to wait for you to get a license, you just made an assumption that you can carry a concealed firearm? Yes, I did. Even though you went through all that training with your security class? Again, I had made the assumption because I had known the previous you, steps of you, what you was were right. training in security class of when you could actually possess the firearm. You had to have a concealed weapon from it, correct? Yes. Right. You didn't have it. No. And you knew what the law was, correct? Yes. Okay. When Officer Rainer approached you, did you say, I have a gun on me? Be careful. Here it is, Officer. I don't want to cause any concerns. I never got to answer or conversate with him too much beyond asking my question. And I didn't, again, I didn't understand why I didn't get an answer. I'll, right. Hmm? Because you didn't answer him. No, I didn't give him an answer until if I lived there. I asked, I asked him what was going on. It wasn't even an right. a effort to pull power. It was just a natural reaction to somebody coming up to me. Ask what happened. Sure. Let's talk about your training. You, you have extensive training with firearms, don't you, sir? Yeah. I, hey, you're very professional with them. You'd agree with me, right? Yes, I would say I'm fired more than a hundred times in your life. Right? Yes, I have. At least maybe a thousand, right? No, I wouldn't say just up to a thousand, but I've fired a... And you possess firearms around other people before, correct? Mm hmm Right? Mm hmm So you know how dangerous they are, right? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. And you know how dangerous they are, right? Yes. Right. And you know you only follow them, and you receive that training in your security class if your life is in danger, right? Mm hmm Is that a yes? Yes. I'm sorry, my bad. Right? Yes. In this case, your life wasn't in danger, was it, sir? Yes, it was. What, what danger? 
Mr. Rayner had me back between. You mean Officer Rayner, right? Officer Rayner? Right, okay. So Officer Rayner, go ahead. When he had me in between my car, the door, my car and the car backed up, I had no, and I had already tried to leave. He had begun to grab me by the back of my shirt and I, I was restricted from everything I was trying to do to prevent any physical encounter or misunderstanding between me and him. And I seen him reaching, I began to be in fear that my life would be taken. Let's and this was already my worst fear in the world, sure. in my life. Sure, but let's break that down. So you said it once again, he had you blocked in, right? Yes. And all you had to do was sit down, right? I could have sat down. But you didn't, did you? No. Right, you didn't comply with it. Because I wanted to walk away. I understand you wanted to walk away, but you could have complied and not got to a point with having used deadly force, correct? I could have sat down. Yes. Right, and complied, right? I can't, yeah. Right. You agree with me, right? Yes. Right. So this whole situation would have been diffused if you had just listened to the law enforcement officer there, correct? But I was trying to, I was already That's in. That's not my question. It could have been diffused if you listened to the law enforcement officer. Isn't that correct? He had already been touching me, so diffusing. Sir, her. that's not my question. Mm -hmm. You said that you had to use deadly force because he's reaching for his weapon, and that only happens because you escalate the situation getting past him. If you had just sat in your car, this would have never happened. We would agree, correct? I wouldn't say it would never happen because I don't know what was on his mind. If you had sat in your car, you would agree with me that Officer Rayner was not just one of them. You would agree that if you had sat in your car and listened to Officer Rayner, there was no threat on you at that point, correct? I wouldn't have perceived any threat. Correct. Let's talk about this. You're talking about that you have to do this and Officer Rayner grabs you. Isn't it in fact true? Look, let's go back and watch it. Let's go frame by frame. Over a little bit the, oh. How's it going? Do you live here? How's it going? Do you live here? He asked you two, two easy questions, right? Didn't respond, right? Let's hear what you say. Live here? Oh, what's, what's going on? Sit down, sit. Let's look at this picture right here. You, you testified with your uh, attorney that this was your sleeve, right? Yes. Okay. You can see that it looks like a joint, too, correct? I. I I know what it is, but I don't know what you can perceive it as, but it was a Swisher. Why are Swisher please a, a much bigger cigarette style? It's a cigar, and I'm at the end of it. I'm at the end of a cigar. So you, it's, would, you would agree that people smoke marijuana in Swisher Sweets, correct? I don't know what people smoke their marijuana out of. But I, smoke, I smoke cigars. So you don't smoke marijuana? No, I have before, but I wasn't smoking marijuana specifically, but I have smoked marijuana before. Because if you were smoking marijuana at that point, that would provide Officer Rayner an opportunity to arrest you. Right? Your Honor, again, it calls for a legal conclusion. Yeah. It, it goes for whether or not he thought the officer could arrest him. Ask me the question again, sir. If that was a marijuana cigarette, <laughs> Do you think Officer Rayner could have arrested him? If it was a marijuana cigarette? I don't know what he could have done if, if you know, he, I don't know what he could you know, have done. that's a crime you're asking for marijuana? Do I, am I aware of it? Yes, I know it's illegal some, in some places because at this point people have license for it. It's legal and marijuana, medical marijuana is legal. I'm not sure. Do you have a medical marijuana person? No, I don't. Okay, so it wouldn't be legal for you, right? No, but I wasn't smoking marijuana. Okay. So you're saying this is the end of your cigar? That's the end, the butt end of my cigar, because it's... Why, why are you trying to conceal it when the officer ran here from nothing? It's visibly out. I didn't try to conceal nothing. Let's watch and look at your uh, phone. How's it going? Do you live here? What's going on? Do you live here? What's going on? So let's just go a little frame by frame. You see it right there in your hand initially? Mm -hmm. You see you're pulling your phone? Uh, my phone is sliding out of my lap. I, I understand what you're saying, sir, but you see you're putting your phone and it seems like you're concealing? Uh, I didn't, it wasn't, I didn't conceal nothing. I just 
was dropping my hands. Okay. So in this instance, Officer Rayner has his arm on you, correct? <laughs> and he's just asking you because you're getting out coming toward him. He's just making space. He's just standing up. Right. He's, he's, not, he's not grasping you here, right? He's just making Your Honor, I object. Best evidence. They've been carrying on about that. You can watch the video. He's the one who's there. Here. You, you would agree right here. He's not grabbing you. He's just pushing you to make distance, right? There was no way to make distance. I was just standing up. Was, there, was, there was no way to make distance because you were approaching toward the law enforcement officer. I was just standing up on the car. Okay, but then he said, sit, 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 with this light little tap, and you didn't sit, right? No, I didn't. I just continued to stand. Yes, sir. You've never met Officer Rayner before, correct? I've never. I didn't even know who he was. Right. No interaction with him before? No, sir. You know how to act with a law enforcement officer, though, correct? Yes. And you know that if there's something that they do illegal, the place to challenge it is in the court system, correct? Did I know that law? Based on your security training. They don't teach you that law in security training. I don't get police training in security training. They give me security training to be a security officer. Not necessarily police officer. We don't learn the statutes of how police con conduct themselves. So you, you, as you sit here today, you didn't know that you can fight in court? If there's something the officer does that you think is wrong? I know that you can make complaints and you can file a, 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 a civil claim, but I didn't, to this degree, uh, there, was no, there was nothing. Let's talk about this body camera. Sorry. So there was nothing. There was nothing I would have done to, I mean, there was nothing I would have been thinking about and because there's nothing necessarily initially making me, you know, want to take him to court. He, he hadn't. He didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, at this point. Right. At this point. He just asked you to comply. He did nothing wrong. I was trying to believe. You weren't complying though, were you? I hadn't done nothing wrong. How do you know? Because I, I've been at, I've been sitting in my car. What if he had a report that he was a suspicious individual? Does he have to relate that to you right away? It would be, he would have to. Jackson, that was for speculation. This video right here that we've watched multiple times, you would agree that that's the complete interaction with you and Officer Ray, correct? To my knowledge. Well, that, that's was there. Was there any other interaction? No, I've never had any, any interaction. That's not my question. Your defense team is making it a big deal about 30 seconds of the video before. Was there any interaction with you and Officer Rayner prior to what we see on this body camera here? No. No. And so, so this body camera is a fair depiction of your entire encounter with Officer Rayner. Do you agree? I'm not sure if he's seen me or if that's seen I'm not, I'm, The question is, your entire encounter with him is all recorded on the body camera, correct? To my knowledge. Well, is there any other part of the interaction that's not codified here? What I'm saying is, I don't know if he has seen me or, and I didn't know he was there. I don't know. That's not, okay. Your interaction, your speaking, communicating, and interacting with Officer Rayner, it is all on this video that we watched, correct? Again, to my knowledge. Well, you keep saying that, but I don't understand what that means. Because I don't know if there is something else somewhere else that I, that I was never made privy to. Are you aware? You were there that night, right? Yes, I Is there any conversations, any interactions before this video starts with you not and with, Not with me and, to, and him. But, so your entire interaction, you, Otha Wallace, mm -hmm. Officer Rayner, right? The entire interaction as far as I know, is on this video. You would agree. It's all on the video. Yes, sir. Thank you. After you shot Officer Rayner, did you call 911 to report that Someone was shot and they needed an ambulance. No, I didn't. Right. And you could have just called anonymous, couldn't you? No, I would. Yeah, I could have. Right. I was, I was so, there was a lot of adrenaline going on, a lot of emotions, and I was, I was too afraid to have any further interaction with another police officer or the force, period, because I didn't know how it would, it would go, given that this one didn't sure. go right. Okay. So, so, you could have called anonymous, right? And you could have reported, oh, there's an officer being shot behind 133. Right? Get an ambulance there. When you say anonymous, I mean, I couldn't have called them out. They have, they, I know that the police record, and I was afraid to have any further interaction with 
a police officer or the force to just unlawfully kill Officer A. Because I just had a situation where I had to defend myself. I didn't, I didn't necessarily know if Mr. Officer Rayner was dead or not. Right, but you just shot him and you didn't call any help for him. I, yeah, I did. I did have to shoot him, but I didn't make it. Like I say, I was afraid to call you, anybody. You're claiming self-defense. You live right across the street in 133. Why didn't you run in there, lock the door, call the police, tell them Officer Rayner's been shot, get an ambulance here. It was an accident. I didn't mean to do it, or it or was self-defense. I need someone to respond. You didn't do that, did you, sir? No. Instead, what you did is you fled, correct? Yeah, they, they, right. They, and you actually drove up to Jacksonville in the car you were in already, right? Yes. Okay. But you didn't go right to Georgia at that time, did you, sir? I was basically driving around aimlessly because I was afraid. Instead, though, what you did is you called your dad and said I need a new car because you wanted to disappear, right? The first thing I said on the phone with my dad, I'm not sure if he remembered, but I was, a, I was, I told him I was scared and that a cop had got shot. But you didn't tell your dad I had a shooting in self-defense, did you? I didn't go into why or anything. I just but, told him that it happened. But you didn't, when you drove up to Jacksonville, you had an opportunity. You know Jacksonville goes straight to Georgia, right? You can it, You could have charged with Yeah, it, Jacksonville on 95, you could go right. there. So you could have taken the vehicle that you killed the police officer in from mm -hmm. that you were driving, and you could have stayed in it on your way to Georgia, correct? Yeah, but I was too afraid to. You were too afraid because you were trying to cover your tracks, right? No, I was, like, again, I was too afraid that if I was seen in the vehicle that I automatically get shot and killed and never have an opportunity to have this day. Why not just drive to the police station, walk inside, read over there, camera, say, I'm the one who did it, please, I need to give my set of story. Those, the, at that moment, those are the very people I was scared for my life from. So you think if you walk into a police station where they've got cameras, all these officers, that they're going to rush at you and just shoot you on camera there? I didn't know how it would go by me trying to explain what took place. So I was afraid. Right, and then in fact, you went all the way to Gainesville, right? To get a different car. I went over to Gainesville, yeah, and I I, I called and- And you backed the car in, right? At Palm Depot, well, you didn't pull it in regular, right? I, backing in is just like a normal way to park. Or it's also a way to avoid someone seeing your license plate, correct? I mean, it could be for somebody else, but that's just the normal way I parked. Sure. So after you just shot a police officer, mm -hmm. you were just thinking, well, well, let me make sure I back in. Let me take a little more effort, back the car in, just make sure. Not trying to get out of the quick, I'm just going to take the extra time to back the car. That's what you're saying? Backing in is, a, is like a forced habit because that's just what I'm used to. I'm back in at work, I'm back in at home. It's, it's just kind of how it happens. You cut your hair after, didn't you, sir? Yes, I did. Right, so avoid attachment, correct? The reason I cut my hair is because I was afraid that if I got identified, I would be killed without question. Right. Once again, you could have went to any police station among hundreds that you passed your way to Georgia. But you didn't stop any of it. No. You didn't call the news media and say, hey, I just had self-defense with a police officer. I need you to come with me when I turn myself in so the police don't kill me, right? I didn't consider that as an option. Instead, you went all the way to Georgia, right? And you go up in a treehouse, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And you, you have an AK-47 style weapon out there with you, correct? Yes. 500 rounds, rounds of ammo. Beyond the scope of your act. 500 rounds of ammo, correct? I don't know, I don't know the specific uh, round count that was. Then you're hiding out there, correct? Just, yeah, I'm just scared and I'm, I'm just feeling, I'm staying where I feel safe. Right. So I can figure out how to bring myself to the, to the law. You would agree Officer Rayner was polite and courteous to you, correct? No. You don't think he was polite and courteous? When he asked the question, but by, with the, I mean, are you talking about verbally or verbally? He was polite and courteous to you. Initially. Yeah, and then you couldn't answer his question, right? No. Okay, even though he was polite and courteous to you. But I asked him a polite and courteous question. Don't you think most importantly, when someone asks you a question, you respond first and then you ask the question after that? In normal communication, but I was, again, I was confused and I asked him a question out of na a natural reaction. It, it wasn't like a casual conversation we was having. I just asked him a question as a natural reaction. Sure. But let's talk about what, this struggle that you say in suits. So tell me how long it takes for you and Officer Rayner to struggle and you pull your gun and shoot him. Did you went through this long thing that took a long time when you were down here describing it? Describe it to us. I was just describing motion by motion. Right, let's, let's hear so it. When it happened, 
when he started to to force me back and push and pull and twist, it was, there was obviously a struggle. You know, you didn't respond. You actually were not moving and getting away from him until he fell on the radio, correct? I had already tried to walk away twice. Right, but you, you know. I, I do, sir. And on the, on the radio, it's when he calls for other officers, or he's getting on his radio, mm -hmm. and he says, Charlie 77, and you say, no, back up, man. Don't you, sir? That's when I reasserted my effort to leave him. You reasserted your effort and pushed Officer Rayner out of the way, didn't you, sir? He was already pulling and twisting me. You pushed him out of the way to get away I, from him. I held my forearm out. That's what I did. Sir, you pushed him away. Right, let's see. Right, he's trying to have you comply, and you pushed yourself away. You would agree that using force against a law enforcement officer, even you and your forearm, that is more of a battery, right? I held my forearm out. Again, you ask him to draw a legal conclusion. Um, yes, sir. You're aware you can't resist police officer with force, can you? Yes. Actually, you're asking for evidence. You're aware you can't do that, right? Yeah. You're aware you can't touch police officer or hit them, correct? I never touched him. I just I, he was coming towards me, and he already had me. So I was trying to create a space where I could walk between the door and him, and I just held my forearm out. The reason I held my forearm out is so that nothing would get misunderstood about me being aggressive towards him. I didn't want him to perceive me as any form of aggressive because that's that's why I held my forearm out. Based on your based on your training in the, the security uh, class and in your other you know maybe training you've had, you would agree by pushing a police officer and trying to get past them. That's not appropriate for someone who the police officer is trying to talk to. Right? I, I never pushed him. I just held my forearm out. I just held it out. And you touched him with it? I didn't intend. He was, he was already in, on my arm. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't like force. I didn't like do any motion like that. I just held it out to try to, to, try to get around the door in the space between him and the door. Where, where was the gun? At this moment, yeah. it was already in my pocket because I was in his pocket. The right pocket. And and where where was it in holster? Yes. Okay. So you had a, a gun in your holster in your pocket. Mm -hmm. You made wings that right? Yes. Right. And tell me how much time it took from when Officer Rayner grabbed you till you shot him. I can't specifically. I would have to reference. I don't want you to watch the video. I want you to tell me from your memory. It's two 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 and a half years ago. So it rather it took a, a couple seconds, or you know. I don't, are you mean by seconds or like milliseconds? I don't know how specific Here's you intend to be here. Here's what I want you to do. You told me that you and Officer Rainer are chest to chest for about mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. I assume for about seconds, is that correct? Well, he's pulling on me. He's pulling me towards him and trying to hold. It, it happened for a good few amount of seconds. I, it took a good few amount, mm -hmm. more than 10? Just about. Okay, so you're tussling for about 10 seconds. You'd agree with me, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? I, I don't want to agree because I don't know specifically if it was 10 seconds or eight seconds or nine and a half seconds. So I'm trying not to, I don't want to be time specific because I can't remember the amount of seconds. Let's give you the benefit of the doubt. Eight or more seconds. Okay. Fair enough? Yes. Okay. You'd agree eight or more seconds that you're tussling in first with him, correct? That he's pulling on me and-, and Right. Pulling on you after, after he queues up on his chart on seven seven and he's still grabbing you here. And then there's another at least eight seconds where you're face to face. Not on the video here, but it, it has to be off video because we don't see you face to face here, correct? We, we, I would say we're pretty face to face. Are you including your time in this one right here? Because all he has is his hand. Let's 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 go forward. Can you sit down on top of you? Okay. Come on now. Okay. So are you talking about this he's tussling with you? I mean, he's, that's why I was making I said he was pushing over on me. He was just directing you to try and have you sit down, correct? I was on, I just talked to him away from him and I stood up. And, but that, that's not a response to my question. Okay. He, he's telling you at this point, please just sit down. Sit down and I'll talk to you, right? Yes. Right. You didn't listen, right? No. And he's got a hand here and a hand here trying to direct you back into the car, correct? He's pushing me into the car. Into the car, right? He's not... He's not using excessive force on you at this time, right? I, I'm beginning to get scared, so I don't, I mean... Did you scream for help from anyone in the community? Scream? Help! It's in the back of the parking lot. 
Everybody's in that house. There's nobody outside. You saw the video before about all those people in a uh, body cam came running out after Officer. Make sure you speak up loud. I will, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Late afternoon. I want to thank you for the time and attention that you've given this matter in this case this week.